last night. Uh, but I'm with you, Shane. It's been a little bit strange. It Like everything, like watching football currently or anything else without crowds, the Ali Pali loses that little bit by not having the Yahoos in their costumes at the moment and, you know, the Colo Colo and Yaya yeah, yeah, chants and stuff like that. It's just that little yeah. bit is kind of taken away. And what's been very strange, you mentioned the walk-ons, they're really short now. It's not mm. someone coming from right down the back of the room and having to work their way through the crowd. It's now like a few steps, they're up on stage and it takes a little bit away. But at the same time, I have to admit, I love this time of year. As you mentioned as well, you know, the football continues. We're right bang smack in the middle of a busy period in the Premier League. Liverpool, uh, top of the table. We'll be talking to Daniel Harris in a few minutes' time. Manchester United resurgent at the weekend with their win against Leeds. And a tasty enough game coming up for them tomorrow evening, Shane, on the back of putting six past Leeds. They have to go to an Everton team who've recaptured a little bit of form again. Yeah, and, and I think Roy Keane mentioned a couple of weeks ago on, uh, could have been on the Sky Sports coverage, uh, Oli needs a trophy. I mean... Clearly getting knocked out of the Champions League before the uh, the knockout phase is a disappointment for Manchester United and for their fans who expect more and demand more, especially when they pushed so hard to, to get that third place finish in the Premier League last year. To go out of... Uh, the Carabao Cup, the EFL Cup, whatever you want to call it, is is a, a massive chance for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. When you look at the, the teams left, City and Arsenal, of course, play tonight. If United can beat Everton, they're into a, a semi-final. I think it's Newcastle are in one of the, the other quarter-final games. Um, Liverpool are gone, of course. So it is a chance, an opportunity for United to win a trophy this season. They'll probably target the FA Cup, you'd imagine, as well, because the Premier League, although they're being mooted as potential title contenders, and I think, as Keane said, it, the best of the rest outside of Liverpool, um, realistically, Liverpool are, are heavy you know, title favourites this year. Um, so if United can pick up a trophy, it would be massive. Some people think they're getting a little bit... The performance was better, and the fact that they got a home win so convincingly, given the uh, state of their home form recently, uh, was a real plus for, for Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. So yeah, huge game tomorrow night, and if they can push on and win that trophy, then, I mean, Solskjaer has, uh, has done a lot of good things for himself. Yeah, at this stage as well, we've got Arsenal, who've got 14 points and 14 in the league. It might be a welcome distraction hosting Man City in the EFL Cup this evening, the way things have gone. This Arteta conversation about the percentages uh, that should have been going into games, it's right up there with Benitez and the facts and Louis van Gaal you know, handing out stats about their attacking a few years ago when he was Manchester United boss. A, a most bizarre press conference that he gave, Shane. And I think it's I think it's actually worse. I think it's worse than the facts. I think it's worse than Jose, you know, freaking out at the press conference and saying three times I've won the Premier League. You know, this is the Arsenal manager essentially telling his fans we actually had a 97% chance of beating Burnley. This is after they've lost one nil. Uh, bizarre stuff for Mikel Arteta. And a manager only delves into those areas uh, of stats when they're under severe pressure. Um, the, the joke kind of earlier in the season around uh, some of Arsenal's coverage when they were playing Purley was, uh, I think Roy Keane mentioned again to Roy Keane, but he mentioned, you know, I think they'll be OK to stay up. And it was a joke at the time, but Alan Shearer speaking at the weekend was kind of like, I'm not so sure anymore that they can 100% stay up. If you look at the state of this squad, um, clearly the manager is is struggling a bit. And the, I think he's 8-11 to 11 on to be the uh, the next manager sacked in the Premier League. But when he's starting to to say things like that, and I think on the back of the papers today, they're talking about massive pay cuts. If Arsenal do get relegated, they'll clearly lose a lot of their players. But all of a sudden, this hypothetical Arsenal to be relegated story, it gathers a bit of legs. We're still in December, granted, but it uh, it isn't out of question that Arsenal could get relegated from the Premier League this year. Who knows? Yeah, and all of the time when their most expensive player is being paid to effectively be a professional Fortnite player in Mesut Ozil. So <laughs> there's been a bit of a kind of changing of thought within some Arsenal fans who may think that creativity is such an issue. And if Lacazette is meant to be the creative influence and Willian really has been creating very little, how bad could it be to maybe get Mesut Ozil back in? Uh, but I think Arteta has very much set his stall that uh, Ozil won't be part of the squad this season. Uh, also, Shane, we had the GA calendar officially confirmed yesterday. I was at the press conference with Fergal McGill. Uh, we know the county is going to be the first half of the year, uh, starting in February with the National Hurling and Football Leagues, and club uh, will have a period then between the end of July until December, because the All-Ireland Finals are brought forward to the middle of July. We'll be talking to the Offaly GA chairman, Mike 
Michael Dignan at around about half past eight. But it seems the right decision, Shane, because, you know, not we see what happens with this cabinet meeting later on today about level three or 3.5 or whatever's going to happen. But realistically, I don't think club would have been able to play uh, between now and February or March anyway. Yeah, and I think that's that's the point because when I first saw this, I was thinking it, this is a risky maneuver by the GA because you know having the intercounty games first when you know fans mightn't be back uh, early next year is a risk because that's where they get most of their money. I think 36 million, almost half of their uh, revenue last year in 2019 was through gate receipts. So this is something that they need. Um, so they're they're biting the bullet. They're saying, you know what, we're going to go for this state aid uh, and get the financial help where we can get it. But Intercounty will be going first. Um, and I know that's something Michael Dignan, who'll be on later, supports. And I think it's hard to argue against it this year of all, next year of all years. Um, but when you see the 50 million loss they've made uh, in the year, they expect to make at least 20 million. I think Fergal McGill said next year. So they are in a bit of financial tro- uh, trouble. But I think the fact that they've lined out what what way it's going to look next year, they need a bit of continuity. I think the All-Ireland final uh, will be, I assume, in July next year. So that'll be the third different month that the All-Ireland final has taken place in in three consecutive years. So it does need a bit of a return to, OK, we, we, we always used to know the All-Ireland final was in September. That will now change. But the GA needs a bit of that tradition back because at the moment, nobody really knows what way the calendar is set. So... I think putting this plan in place, you spoke to Virgil McGill yesterday, That's it's the next positive step for the GEA and what's been a, a turbulent 12 months for them. So it, the only way is up, I think. Yeah, we'll dig into that in a little bit more detail a little bit later on. You are watching and listening to OTBAM. It is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. We have a very busy show coming up between now and 10 a.m. Uh, between now and then, in the next few minutes, we'll be uh, getting a roundup of the sports headlines with Amory Donlan. We'll then be speaking to Daniel Harris about the football looking ahead to that game between Man City and Arsenal. Former Lions, Ireland and Leinster captain Brian O'Driscoll is with us just after 8 o'clock. It's a busy festive period uh, for the rugby too with the Guinness Pro 14 derbies coming up this weekend. We'll be reflecting on the Champions Cup fixtures uh, from the weekend just gone by. Munster and Leinster both in tremendous form, uh, unbeaten in their nine games so far. They clash at Thoman Park on Saturday. Half past eight, Michael Dignan, the Offaly GEA chairman, will join us to talk about that GEA calendar, the potential as well uh, for a merger between the Camogie Ladies Football and GEA in the future. Uh, Dublin winning four All-Ireland titles in ladies football at the weekend. Sinead Ahern making a bit of history by becoming the first player to ever lift the Brendan Martin on four separate occasions. We'll be talking to their penalty scorer 1-3 on the day, Carla Rowe, who now has her fourth medal. Uh, remarkably enough, at the age of 25, she is played in seven successive All-Ireland finals, losing three, but now winning the last four on the bounce. And we'll be telling you uh, just after nine o'clock about a new podcast that we have on the OTB Sports Network, which will go live at two o'clock this afternoon, looking at the most remarkable of seasons that's just gone by in 2020. That is the split season. We'll give you more detail on that just after two. It is time for us now to uh, get up to speed with what's happening this morning with the sports headlines. And we're joined from OTB Towers by Amory Donnellan. Good morning, Amory. Morning, Will. Hi, how are you? It feels strange for me to be here and you to be over there. I hope I don't break anything. <laughs> Look, I'm not, I'm not going to complain about the fact that uh, I was able to get up and do the show from home this morning. But uh, what's on the agenda this morning, Amory? Well, Chelsea moved up to fifth in the Premier League table last night. That was with a 3-0 win over West Ham at Stamford Bridge. Tammy Abraham there scoring twice in the last 15 minutes. Thiago Silva as well finding the back of the net early on. The win comes after back-to-back defeats for Frank Lampard's side and he said it was good to get back on track. There was a little bit of tension going into the game today in a good way. I thought the players were like that in the last couple of days training and they had to fight through it. I think it's like that when you when you come off it slightly, there's no easy way back other than a bit of graft and I think we showed that tonight without being beautiful. It was a really good result for us. Elsewhere then, Will Wolves boss Nuno Espirito Santo. He was left pretty frustrated last night, his side beaten 2-1 away from home by Burnley. And after the game, he said that referee Lee Mason, although he didn't actually make any major mistakes last night, he said he's not up to standard for the top level. All the games that we have with Lee Mason is always the same. He cannot control the players. The players are constantly arguing. Both teams, all the other referees, the game flows, the decisions are accepted, uh, there's dialogue. He's not, he's not ready to do it. 
And tonight, Arsenal host Manchester City in the Carabao Cup quarter final. Mikel Arteta will have his stats ready, but he'll be without Pierre Emerick Aubameyang. He continues to recover from a calf injury. Kickoff at the Emirates is at eight, and before that, Brentford entertain Newcastle. That one gets underway at half five. Just a quick look in the GAA. The Electric Ireland Munster Minor Football Championship final takes place today. Clare and Kerry in that one at the LIT Gaelic Grounds throw-in is at seven o'clock. In rugby, Gary Ringrose is set to miss Leinster's Pro 14 clash with Munster on St. Stephen's Day, but he should be fit for Ireland's Six Nations campaign next year. The centre suffered another jaw injury in Saturday's Heineken Champions Cup win over Northampton at the RDS. And just finally for now, Gerwin Price survived a scare last night as he got his PDC World Championship campaign underway. The Iceman beat fellow Welshman Jamie Lewis 3-2, so he needed five sets there to reach the third round. Elsewhere, then, there are two Irish players in action today. Fermanagh's Brendan Dolan takes on Edward Folks of Japan. That's at lunchtime. And then this evening, Carlos Steve Lennon takes on South African Devin Peterson. That's in the second round. Great stuff. Thanks a million to Amri. Competition time here on OTBAM, and you've got a chance to win a great prize this morning. A one-for-all gift card from your local post office is the perfect last-minute gift for all the family, friends and colleagues who are looking for presents this Christmas. They'll be available for purchase from post offices nationwide right up until closing time, which is 1pm on Christmas Eve. So that's Thursday. Uh, this morning, we're giving you the chance to win a, two, a 100 euro one-for-all gift voucher before 10am. To enter, all you have to do is guess our mystery voice this morning and WhatsApp your name and your answer to 087 9180 180. That's 087 9180 180. So, who's this? He's a physical monster. He does all his work every single day. He's a handful in and around the box as well. Not sure if that's potentially talking about Conor Callaghan's transformation in recent seasons. Let's just hear the uh, mystery voice there again. He's a physical monster. He does all his work every single day. He's a handful in and around the box as well. All right, so there you go. If you uh, want to take part in the uh, competition, all you have to do is WhatsApp the answer to that mystery voice to our WhatsApp number. That is also the number for your comments this morning, which is 87 180 for the potential to win uh, that gift voucher, which we'll announce just before 10 o'clock this morning. Meanwhile, on otbsports.com, uh, where the team are going to be updating your stories today, uh, you can see in uh, a full report on last night's darts, the Iceman, uh, number two C, Gerwin Price going through, eventually winning that all Welsh battle. Uh, we've also got reaction from last night's off the ball, Kevin McMenamin, uh, who was talking about not holding back his emotions after Dublin won their eighth Sam Maguire in 10 seasons last evening. Uh, Mo Salah potentially uh, looking to try and get himself a new contract. Uh, well earned, uh, given the way he's been playing. Two goals at the weekend against Crystal Palace. Pat Nevin has been looking at that. There was plenty of speculation at the weekend uh, that Mo Salah might be looking to move on. Uh, but why would he want to leave Liverpool uh, when they're the best team in Premier League and arguably uh, up there with Bayern Munich as the best team in Europe? We also have got uh, two pieces from our conversations with Kira Trant uh, from off the ball last evening, the Dublin goalkeeper uh, who kept goal in their four in a row success when they beat Cork at the weekend by five points. Her teammate Carla Rowe uh, will join us a little bit later on in the programme. Also, Johnny Cooper is saying that the tackle where people felt he should have received a black card in the All Ireland football final on Saturday, he felt it wasn't a black card. And you can also read more about the GA season for 2021. A uh, reaction from that press conference, which uh, I was at yesterday, uh, where Fergal McGill. Uh, uh, was talking about the GEA's plans for this season. Now, time for us to have a chat about football because it is a pretty busy period, including those EFL Cup quarterfinals coming up over the next weekend, or the next couple of days, I should say, and Premier League back at the weekend. Uh, we're joined now by Daniel Harris. Daniel, good morning to you. Hi. Uh, we were having a chat, Daniel, about uh, Chelsea just a few minutes ago when we were going through the sports news. Uh, they beat West Ham 3 0, uh, ending this run of a couple of defeats that they had uh, coming into that fixture. Tammy Abraham scoring again twice last night. They go back up to fifth place. What's your assessment of Chelsea now that these new signings have had a bit of a chance to settle over these first 14 games or so? Um, I think ultimately it looks to me like it's all predicated on one guy, and that's uh, Hakim Ziyech. They, they won last night, Chelsea, and they, they didn't really play well. And the thing that's been noticeable is that it all seemed to work when Ziyech was fit, and now Ziyech's not fit, and it's all a bit of struggle. 
And I think he is the player who opens everything out for them. He's got he's got vision, he's got confidence, he's got skill. He's just he's just I guess he's he's the man that makes it happen. And it just doesn't look quite what, like it all works when he's not there. But I should say that I, I'm I'm quite surprised that this has happened. That Thiago Silva seems to have made a really big difference to the defence. And I'm quite surprised because like, he's not someone I ever thought was even that good when he was at his peak. But he's also come in and he's made, yeah, he's made a significant difference, stopped them conceding goals, which allows them to win games like last night when they don't play particularly well. I wonder how much of a concern Timo Werner's form is going to be, though, Daniel, at this stage. Ten games now in all competitions for Chelsea where he hasn't scored. He admitted at the weekend the physicality of the Premier League has surprised him somewhat. You know, Frank Lampard backed him again last evening, but when you've got Tammy Abraham coming in and scoring goals, you've got Olivier Giroud uh, scoring when he's played in Europe, maybe that just kind of lessens the pressure on Timo Werner a little bit? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, uh, Abraham and Giroud aren't going to score the goals that are going to make Chelsea League champions, which is where they want to get to. Uh, won't be this season, I wouldn't have thought. They, I mean, I, I guess they hope that Werner, that Werner will be good enough. Um, he's, he's an interesting player, Werner, because... He kind of wants to play centre forward, but he's not quite a centre forward, and he wants to play, and he doesn't quite want to play on the left. So, it's not it's not necessarily easy to configure an attack for him because I think at Leipzig it was different because he was maybe the biggest star in the team, so he could had more scope to to do what he wanted. Whereas Chelsea, he's kind of one of a team. So where you actually use Werner is not so easy to work out because. He doesn't do everything you'd like a centre forward to do, but you don't want him on the left because you want him with the ability to score goals and to be involved, to be involved when the ball gets to the box as much as possible. So he sort of likes to play almost a dual role, like coming off the left a little bit because that means he's harder to track because he's coming from inside to outside. But again, he's not a left winger, so he's not going to offer you the option of going on the outside. So I think. Some players adjust to new leagues immediately and other players take more time. And the difference between the ones who are brilliant and the ones who aren't isn't necessarily speed of acclimatisation. But I think what Werner is, is Werner is ultimately a very good player, but he's probably not ever going to be a definitive player. So that's not necessarily... I'm not saying that means he's a bad signing for Chelsea. I think he's a decent signing for Chelsea, but I don't think he's going to be the transformative player. He's going to require lots of things to be going right around him for him to be able to deliver his best. Yeah, the other game last evening, the half half five kickoff was a 2-1 victory uh, for Burnley against Wolves, Ashley Barnes and Chris Wood getting the goals either side of half time. That moves Burnley out of the relegation zone. They're just one point behind Arsenal now in the Premier League table. Arsenal have had a horrible start, Daniel, to the season. You know, 14 games in, only 14 points, just four victories during that period. It's their worst start to a season since 1975. What did you make of Mikel Arteta's comments about these percentages of winning games and games that should be won? I think it bemused a lot of Arsenal fans after that defeat against Everton at the weekend. Yeah, I mean, I guess I made the same of it as everyone else made of it. But what on earth are you talking about, mate? But I think he he's not exuding confidence or competence at the moment. Like You don't watch him and think, I think you're going to get them out of this because... It feels a lot like the reason they're in this is part is because he's not experienced enough at his job and isn't good enough at his job to be able to make it any different with the players that he has. And make no mistake, it's not possible to do worse with this group of players. They're not a good group of players. That's that that's the most important thing still. But it's not possible to do worse with them. They shouldn't be here. I'm absolutely certain that the board will do everything possible not to fire him. But if in the new year this run of miserableness is still continuing, I think they'll probably conclude that they don't have a choice. And he doesn't... It's When managers say ridiculous things, part of you thinks, well, do they actually believe it? Because managers say those... Those managers say those ridiculous things to divert attention away from where they don't want you to be looking. It's just misdirection, really. So if he goes out and says something stupid, then perhaps people will be talking about the stupid thing that he said rather than what his players are up to. Problem being, it seems a lot like he really believes what he's saying. I mean, he says it with feeling, with honesty, and he's, he's not an actor. So he, but he's extremely convincing if he is indeed portraying this role. And I think Arsenal fans will be worried that the stuff that he's saying sounds a lot like stuff he believes, and there's no counterpoint to it. So it's not like Alex Ferguson used to go out and say something ridiculous, 
and then his team would go and win the next game and they'd also have won lots of trophies previously. He's coming out, he's talking nonsense and they've scored, what is it, two open play goals in nine games or something, ten games. So there's none, there's not, that counterpoint to the misdirection isn't there. Daniel, uh, just on Arsenal, I mean, they've got a couple of fixtures coming up that will not arrest the, the, the nerves or the pressure on Arteta. They've got City, obviously, in the Carabao Cup and then Arsenal or Chelsea in the Premier League at the weekend. So we've been having this discussion earlier and I guess earlier in the season when Arsenal were losing, the talk of relegation was more tongue-in-cheek that nobody ever thought it was a realistic possibility. Looking at this Arsenal squad now and I guess the fact that they have the likes of Mesut Ozil sitting on the bench, uh, not even on the bench, in fact, not even in the squad, but is talk of an Arsenal relegation realistic possibility at this point? Um, Probably not. I mean, it's not something you can ignore because of where they are in the league. And I think one of the other slightly interesting things about the league is that um, Sheffield United look look down. I mean, it's gonna, they're going to have to do something immense to get up from there. And it's very hard to see what West Brom are going to do about this without spending a load of money that doesn't seem like they're going to spend. There's not a lot to work with there. But then the last spot, the last relegation spot, is actually you've got no idea who's going to end up in that because the teams, all the teams above the bottom two, have reasons as to why you think they might stay up. And it seems inconceivable that Arsenal will allow this to go on long enough so that they don't get a better manager in because this squad is not a relegation squad. It's not a good squad, but it's not a relegation squad. So it would be really, it seems unlikely that it will happen. But at the same time, it's quite hard to arrest the decline. And stranger things have happened. So, I, I mean, I'm assuming that Arsenal will spend some money in January to make sure that they don't go down. Although, quite who would want to play for this Arsenal, who who is worth having, is a, is a different question. But they should probably be able to find enough that will keep them up. So, yeah, I don't think they'll go down. But you can't ignore the fact that almost halfway through the season and they are looking like a team that could. Yeah, that Brighton game next week looks perhaps even as crucial as Chelsea and Man City. Uh, they play Man City in the EFL Cup this evening. You've got Everton against Manchester United tomorrow. Everton on the back of their victory at the weekend against Arsenal in the Premier League. Uh, Daniel, what was your assessment of Manchester United against Leeds at the weekend? You know, Scott McTominay uh, getting two goals, plenty of praise from his manager. And generally, they started maybe converting some of those chances uh, which those front players hadn't been doing in recent weeks. Um, yeah, you know, I played pretty well. Um, it felt a little bit like, so even so, what you say about the chance conversion, United should have scored 10 goals in that game. And, I, I, and the lack of ruthlessness in finishing, I think, is still a big problem. When I look at that team, and I know people like to say, well, they struggle to break down mass defences, that kind of thing. I don't see that as a tremendous problem with this team because it's not something like they're generally just scoring goals now. Um, the thing, the two things that need sorting with this team are the defending. And if you watch the Leeds game, you would see that that's something that still needs defending. Like they could have easily conceded six. And is there, a, and is the ruthlessness in finishing? Because on another day, Leeds would have scored and made the game much closer than it was because of when the chances occurred. So I thought the United, United played well. They look they look like a good team now. And I mean, I've been saying that on here for quite some time that their top level is a really good level, and I do think they're the second best team in the league. Um, and whether they can go on from here depends on resolving those two aspects. Can they stop giving their opponents chances? Because they've been getting out of it recently in the league, but that's not sustainable. And can they finish their own chances? And in particular, Anthony Martial used to be, maybe before Mason Greenwood turned out, the best finisher at the club. But since the Europa League semi, semi-final against Sevilla, where his finishing was what one of the major reasons United didn't go through, his finishing seems to have absolutely deserted him and you can't have that from a centre forward. Even though Martial played really well in the game and he gives you so much more than just finishes, you can't have a centre forward who's regularly missing one-on-ones. I mean, he missed, he missed two on Sunday. But in general, Ole got his tactics bang on. And sometimes you feel like the way people talk about that, it's like, well, yeah, it was obvious what you need to do against Leeds, to which the question would be, well, why isn't everyone doing it? But you can see you can see a team growing. Like they've got options in attack, they've got options in midfield, but the defending is still is still not good enough. Even though you just feel like if someone whispered in Aaron Wan Bissaka's ear, look over your shoulder every few seconds, that would make a lot of it better. I want to give Ole Gunnar Solskjaer a little bit of credit tactically at the weekend too, because as you say, Leeds have been very good against the teams towards the top of the table. But I thought Solskjaer actually deployed the team. Pretty much perfectly tactically at the weekend. He made sure there was plenty of pace 
legs in midfield in terms of McTominay and Fred. Then he had uh, Daniel James uh, to pin Leeds back on the right-hand side. And Manchester United running at Leeds caused them plenty of problems. While Solskjaer has sometimes been questioned about his setup in some of these fixtures, I thought he got a spot on on Sunday. Yeah, he did. I think that if you look Ole, all the way through, there's a litany of games in which he's absolutely nailed his tactics. And I think that his understanding of where a team's weak points are is excellent. And you've seen it over and over and over again, where he's come up with bespoke tactics for a game and it's worked. I think the, what, what isn't quite right with Ole sometimes, to me anyway, is that He's too negative at the wrong times, and he doesn't have a squad for that. He has a squad that wants to go forward and is at its best when going forward. And that is the best way now of deploying the players that he has. Like he got it totally wrong in Leipzig because he went into that game inviting pressure on the defence, which isn't good at withstanding pressure. But when he looks at how to hurt the opposition, he very often comes up with the right answer. And what he has to do is he has to allow his team to settle now, I think. It seems that he's back to 4-2-3-1, and there are lots of ways this team can play because they have a lot of good players, but if he's going to settle on 4-2-3-1, I personally prefer 4-3-3, but if he's going to settle on 4-2-3-1, then he needs to just leave that alone and change some players because obviously there are a lot of games coming up and he has a lot of players that he wants to use. But I think... Often football is overcomplicated in terms of tactics, where really the most important things are the ability and mentality of the players. And if with the players that United have, if you give them the freedom to go out and do their thing, obviously you have to give them some instructions too, and you have to take note of what your opponents might do. But if United go into games with the intention of attacking and and uh, using using their imagination and actually really committing to it. I was watching I watched an old United game against uh, a game they lost actually last week against Real Madrid. I watched a game from 2000. And one of the mm. things that stood out was um, the simplicity of the way that United played. They generally weren't into like flicks and tricks and only when it was really necessary. But what they did was they picked options, they picked them really early and then they committed to them. And that is one of the things that this team needs to learn. Even against Leeds, they scored six goals. But you saw frequently, frequently, Marcus Rashford would get the ball and instead of taking the first option quickly, he'd try and work a better shooting lane. He'd try and see if there was a better passing lane. You end up getting crowded out. And I think it's the ruthlessness of having the confidence in your ability to see something and act really quickly that is been a, was definitely a feature of the best Alex Ferguson teams and is something that if this team learned to do that, they will score even more goals than they're scoring at the moment. Uh, Daniel, for all the shortcomings in Manchester United squad over the last uh, number of years, I mean, I have the bench from um, the, the, the most recent game in front of me. So Henderson, by Alex Tellez, Matic, Pogba, Van de Beek, Mata, Greenwood and Cavani. I mean, the, the strength and depth there, some people arguing on Twitter saying it was probably the best bench of any club team in Europe across the weekend. So... Uh, Manchester United strength and depth. Though. We've got the, the great Phil Jones as well to return in the, in the new year. I think Ole Gunnar Solskjaer hinted at that a, a week or two ago. But where, where does this United squad rank in terms of strength of depth of United of United squads gone by? Yeah, it's, the, the, it's good. The the first eleven still needs some attention, but they've got good, when everyone's fit, they've got good options, and that's really the way it should be. And you can't argue with the way that Ole has built it in that aspect. Um, and whilst at the same time also. Re also re-energising the youth setup, like where there's lots of players who, there are a lot of players currently in the youth setup who United think are going to make the first team. There's there's Ethan there, there's Hannibal Medry who Ole bought from from Monaco. Uh, there's Facundo Pellistri. Uh, there's uh, Diallo who's coming in January. So, what you see with United is a club that when Ole took over was absolutely on its ass. I mean, it really was. Like the they lost the last Mourinho game was a dreadful defeat to Liverpool. But just the players that miserable, the good players were starting to want to leave. They didn't have as many young players who were coming through. And what Ole has done is he's sorted out the that side of it. And he's doing a good job of sorting out the first team. And as you say, he now has options. So I mean, people people t people laugh when he signed Cavani. They say Cavani is coming for the money, which to me always looked kind of strange because if you're someone who, I can't even remember how old Cavani is, is he 34, who has spent the amount of time that Cavani has spent being an elite level athlete and an elite level competitor and playing in teams that have won trophies it is possible that you might just turn up and decide to take the money but it seems far more likely that you're going to want to turn up and compete because 
that's what you do. And who wants to turn up at Manchester United and just not do anything where when everyone's looking? And so they've got those options off the bench. And if you even think back to last season, they signed uh, Igalo on loan because they didn't have anyone else and they couldn't find anyone else. And that had to constitute an emergency option. Whereas now the options aren't emergency options. They're options that change the focus of the way that you want to play. So the bringing, bringing Dan James in for the game on Sunday is a good example of that. Or they wanted something specific and he had it available to him. And so he was able to deploy it and it also happened to work. But if it didn't work, as you say, he had Cavani on the bench and he had, and he had Mason Greenwood on the bench. So that is one of the ways, actually, that the Fergie won games towards the end. When, when, he, when his sort of last great team, the 08 09 team, got old and um, City had a lot more, were given a lot more money to spend than he had, so had a free run at Yaya Toure, Aguero, at David Silva, players that United might have been interested in if they didn't have the Glazers draining the money. So what Fergie did was he knew that, I felt, felt anyway, like he knew he couldn't compete in terms of the strength of the first 11, which is why the year that City won the league in 2012, the direct games between the team, you could see that City were a much better team. But what Fergie had was he, had, he bought an absolute load of wingers and a load of centre-forwards because he knew that those are the players that will help you decide games in, when games are tight, when you're able to bring on someone who does something different to what the other players that you had before you did. And United are sort of getting towards that point. They still don't even have any kind of right winger in the squad until Diallo arrives. So I think that will make a difference. But they do now have various midfield options. They have Polka on the bench at the weekend as well. And and then various attacking options, which is giving them the opportunity to change games if it's not working, which we saw against Southampton and West Ham a couple of weeks ago. There's no argument from many circles that Liverpool aren't a better team than Manchester United. And they've impressed without Van Dijk uh, for large portions of this season. Anfield has become a bit of a fortress even without the fans. Um, if you had to get your crystal ball out and look ahead to, to April or May briefly, do you see a title race uh, this season? And if so, do you see United being a, a part of that? Um, I think that if there is a title race, United will be in it. Um, if Liverpool run away with it, then that looks not unlikely at all. That's very possible. But it's, it's strange because you look at United and you think this is not yet a title winning team. But on the other hand, you look at they've got so many goals in the squad that they have enough to win most games. And it's kind of nagging at me that a run the, the like of which United, uh, United produced from February to the end of last season would probably take them quite close. And they should be better now than they are then, than, than they were then. So it is nagging at me. It is possible. Um, I mean, they've got some tricky games coming up. They've got to play Leicester. They've got to play Wolves. They've got to play Liverpool. If they were to take kind of six, seven points out of those, then they would be in with a chance, particularly if they managed to not lose to Liverpool. So I think we'll probably know more about it in the new year. But as I said earlier, I do think United are the second best team in the league. Now, it might be they might be the third best team in the league, to paraphrase Shane Warne, between Liverpool and Daylight. And Liverpool don't have... like United could do with Liverpool having the difficult games now and United having slightly easier ones. But Liverpool have got West Brom next. I uh, can't remember who they've got after that. And then they've got Southampton away. So... I guess that's the game where you might think if Liverpool were to drop points there and United were to win, then they could close the gap. But if United come out of the new year and the gap is still where it is now, five points with the game in hand, then they're, they're in with a chance of doing something. But of course, the thing about Liverpool is that they know how to win. They expect to win the title. They know what it takes to win the title. And they, they, they know what, in, what is necessary to make it happen because they know they can make it happen. And I think that's what we've seen when they've been without all these players, but it doesn't matter always because the confidence that they have and the desire that they have to show that they can win is enough to give them the opportunity to win and to make sure that they do win. And you can run out of that sometimes, but at the moment, the confidence they have from having won is seeing them through, obviously, aside from the quality of the players that they have. Daniel, thanks a million for joining us this morning. Enjoy the festive football and have yourself a very Merry Christmas over the next few days. You too, everyone. See you again. Happy New Year. Many well. thanks there to Daniel Harris. Still plenty to come between now and 10 a.m. here on OTB AM. We've got a pack show still to come. Carla Rowe, Dublin ladies footballer, and Michael Dignan will join us later this hour. Up next, we're going to be chatting to Brian O'Driscoll. OTB AM on OTB Sports Radio, Ireland's first and only sports radio station. Off the ball. For people to look at Roy Keane and say they're not going to take him because of what he might say as a pundit is ludicrous. It's ridiculous. 
How are you not going to have a player like that, a, a, a manager like that, who's, who's had the career he's had, and not try and tap into that to help your team? They're missing a trick. All of them who's just not taking them. Missing a trick. Off the ball. Weeknights from 7 and weekends from 1. This is OTB Sports Radio. Live 24-7 on the OTB Sports app. OTB AM. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters. You're very welcome back. OTBM live this morning in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. As I mentioned, still plenty to come between now and 10. We're going to be talking Gaelic football, uh, hurling and ladies football in about half an hour's time. And it's time for us now to have a chat about rugby. We're going to be taking a look back on the uh, Champions Cup uh, from the weekend just gone by and also a look forward uh, to the games in the Pro 14. Uh, before we chat to Brian O'Driscoll, though, it's uh, of course, a lot happening on otbsports.com if you want to check out what's been happening in terms of your overnight sports news, including that discussion that Pat Nevin had with Joe on Off the Ball last night about Mohamed Salah potentially looking for a new contract at Liverpool. It could be the last major contract and a good time for him to cash in while he's currently the top scorer in the Premier League. Kira Trance, Dublin Eddie's goalkeeper, was also speaking to us last evening about the responsibility of being at the very back rear guard on that Dublin team for their five points success against Cork in the All-Ireland Ladies Football, uh, which was played, of course, on Sunday. Dublin winning four in a row. Carla Rowe will be joining us in about half an hour's time. Also interviews with two of the Dublin footballers on the back of their six in a row with the Sam Maguire, with Kevin McMenamin and also Johnny Cooper on last night's Off the Ball. Uh, Kevin McMenamin talking about you know, potentially this being his last All-Ireland medal, having won eight. Johnny Cooper with seven, so 15 All-Ireland medals between the two of them. We've got a review of last night's darts, including Gerwin Price qualifying uh, for the round of 32 and plenty of reaction uh, from the weekend's rugby too where Keith Wood was on the show on Monday Night Rugby uh, talking about that uh, potential red card uh, where Tom Wood went in on Josh van der Fleer in a ruck with about 10 minutes to go in the game between Leinster and Northampton. It sparked plenty of debate uh, over the last few days. Uh, so we'll have uh, Brian Driscoll uh, back on in a second uh, to have a chat about all of the rugby. Uh, look through uh, some of the uh, newspaper this morning too. Understandably a lot of coverage on the back of the GA announcing uh, their fixture schedule for 2021. It means that the county season is going to start before the club. Uh, new All-Ireland final dates at the weekend of July the 11th for the All-Ireland hurling final and then we've got the football final coming up the weekend after that. Also the GA are going to have to seek state aid uh, to try and run the 2021 games because once again uh, they're going to be short of money. Uh, so understandably that's across a lot of the papers. Uh, Mikel Arteta's comments talking out of his arsenal on the back of the Irish Daily Star today. Uh, his comments about the percentages on games uh, where Arsenal should have won in recent weeks. Odds man out, back of the mirror today. At this stage, Mikel Arteta is now the odds-on favourite to be the second manager to lose his job. Uh, first with Slavin Bilic, who has been replaced uh, by Sam Allardyce at West Brom. Uh, back page of the Irish Independent. Uh, the first split season, in essence, coming uh, with those All-Ireland All finals moving back to July. Uh, staying put, uh, that's the fact that Tipperary and Cavan will be guaranteed a place in the All-Ireland Championship for next year. Uh, Michael Clifford's story on the back of the Daily Mail. The provincial winners, that includes Mayo too, even if they drop into Division 3 uh, for next season, they will be able to play for the Sam Maguire next season. Time for us now to have a chat about rugby. Uh, former Lions, Leinster and Ireland captain Brian O'Driscoll is with us now. Brian, good morning to you. Morning, lads. How are you? Good. I mean, this is a kind of a, a busy period coming up. There's no rest usually for players at this time of year. Uh, there will be a certain amount of rotation, which we talk about almost year on year now uh, with the Guinness Pro 14. But how did you find it, Brian, these kind of festive periods when you were playing? Because uh, given the way that things are packed in with the Champions Cup, there's not a huge amount of rest for the players coming up over the next couple of weeks. No, there's not. But, you know, you will be given a quota of time that you're allowed um, over the you know, the, be it the three games usually in the lead up to the next round of Champions Cup. Um, you know, that dictate comes from IRFU and from the national coach. So the provincial coaches have to pick and choose where best to, to use those players. Usually there's a, a focus on one game where they um, load a lot of their international players and, and then they try and give them another break. See, the difference between the internationals is once we get into January, there'll be no break, whereas provincial players 
you get to that week before um, Six Nations and and they'll be given a, a week away. So it's just about managing minutes uh, on feet. The rotation in the provinces now is, is changed from one from my time as well. Um, you look at the strength of the squads and the quality of players being able to come in and, and do just as good a job, um, you know, particularly when you look at what Leinster have done over the last couple of seasons. Now Munster are coming to, fo- to the fore on that as well. So you, you realise that um, you're the entertainment around Christmas, you know, you're, you know, be it on Seams Day or on New Year's Day or day after. It, the reality is you've never really, uh, if you come in straight after school, you've never really missed it because you've never had it in the first place. So um, it's just part and parcel of being a pro and um, don't don't have a glass of wine with your Christmas dinner, but fill your boots still. Yeah, Thoman Park uh, this coming Saturday for Munster against Leinster in the Guinness Pro 14. Uh, Brian, Munster coming back at the weekend against Clermont Auburn in France, 19 points down at the stage. They win by 39 points to 31. Alan Quinlan was saying on the programme yesterday morning, he thinks it's right up there with the miracle match, maybe even Munster's best ever performance in Europe, possibly the best ever Irish performance on French soil. For you, where does it rank, Brian? Yeah, it definitely ranks right up there. Um, I think... It's amazing because we've expected it of other teams in the past and maybe that expectation isn't quite there of this Munster team yet. And so when you get pleasantly surprised by that, that, you know, the the jersey hasn't gone away and and the individuals in it maybe not quite of the same calibre of of, previous successful periods, but the bottle in the heart is still there. And um, in most cases, I don't know very many teams that you know conceding a bonus point after 25 minutes wouldn't have felt well this is this is damage limitation um whereas you know they just stayed in the fight they they just thought about trying to win you know win the next play and 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 slowly progressively got into the game and it, it was an amazing I, I actually only unfortunately I went to the airport uh just after half time so i was kind of following it on on online and um and so i didn't get to fully appreciate the manner in which they turned the screw turned um and i suppose the only shame really is that there wasn't a packed crowd in there to experience it as well for for them to silence them as well and um it was it was just it was a phenomenal performance from lots of individuals but even the way they turn their scrum around, you know, Josh Witcherly in the first half, um, getting you know, getting his wings, and I think we've all seen those pictures of how high he was in that scrum down close to the Claremont line, um, and then for them to turn around and get the ascendancy in the scrum is a amazing mental um, flip and attitude from those front rowers and from the pack to scrum as eight, but also huge kudos to Graham Rowntree who solved those problems at half time. So. Uh, definitely one for the ages. I guess you've got to look when you compare it to other uh, successful uh, European um, victories for for Munster or for other Irish provinces. You know what's at stake. Yes, it, it's still a pool ma- pool match. So I think you look at Toulouse away um, with Munster. You look at some of the other ones. Maybe Claremont away for Leinster in in the semi final. When you get to knockout stages and and there's a final. Um, to be played for, I think that maybe just ups the stakes. So it's right in the conversation of the best ones. Uh, JJ Hanrahan as well, Brian. This has to be a huge boost from 24 points in the night, 100% from the kicking tee. The question marks have always been there about his clutch kicking. Uh, you know, when Munster really needed him to score in big games, you've got Healy emerging as potential competition for the 10 shirt. I'd imagine this is a huge boost for Hanrahan, that performance at the weekend. Yeah, because we, we know what JJ is capable of with ball in hand. He's always been that type of player and, and maybe not not out of the mould of, of Raj um, or, or what, you know, coming in as a successor, what was previously there. Um, so he, you know, he's always had that attacking game and and the, the issues have, have always arisen around his, his ability to be able to keep that scoreboard ticking over and clutch kicks. And um, we saw it in, uh, you know, in the second part of, of last year when the, when the game reemerged in August. You know, he, he struggled in the semi-final against Leinster and, and a couple of clutch kicks that just could have kept Munster in the game and, and he missed them. And, and I suppose it's, it's a bit of a thankless job. It's, it's expected of you to knock those kicks over. And when you miss them, you know you're the 
um, you know, you're the bad guy in the team and you're the one that, that gets, um, you know, gets the, the stick from people because you've, you've just got to, you know, if you're going to go and, and take on goal kicking, you've got to have an ability to um, keep, the, keep the team in the game. Um, but no huge credit to him on, on this occasion. You know, he was knocking them over from everywhere. He was obviously in a real groove too. You could tell that, you know, it wasn't like that, you know, they were he was just creeping them over. The the one that hit the crossbar was a magnificent kick from 45 out. You know, that that is a huge confidence builder. And to go nine from nine and then play the way he did and run the back line the way he did and, and navigate the team into the right parts of the field. It was a it was an excellent performance from him. And if he can keep that up, he'll he'll get his name back into international reckoning where maybe he once was. We'll chat about your old team, Leinster, in a bit more detail in a moment. But Leinster go to Munster this weekend. And I wonder, Brian, is the importance maybe a little bit more for Munster coming into this? You know, both teams unbeaten in their first nine games this season. Munster have got a chance maybe to banish a few recent defeats against Leinster. Another semi-final defeat is still very fresh in the memory in the Pro 14 semis just a couple of months ago. How much of a boost would it be for Munster to beat, even if it is a slightly de- depleted Leinster team on Saturday? Yeah, I think that with the rivalries, anytime you beat one another, it's it's a shot of a shot in the arm of confidence, and um, because they're good good sides, and particularly away from home, and um, from a Leinster perspective, it's then in it's it's then at home park. Am I right? It is. Um, yeah. So you know, the, I think I, I'm am I right in saying Leinster are the last team to beat uh, Munster down in home, and so you, you, they've got a you know a proud record down there. They hate losing. Um, in Limerick and and yeah this is a great opportunity to build on what they feel is is the direction that they're going in and for the first time in a few years it, it, there's 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 been consistency to their performance there's been consistency to seeing how their shape has evolved in attack in particular um how they're um using their big ball carriers as dummy runners as well as um ball players i think CJ Stander and Peter Romani to great effect at the weekend, you know, behind CJ a couple of times, you know, bite, having defenders bite in, and then Peter using the subtlety for that Mike Haley try. Those sort of things are new aspects that we haven't seen in their game previously. So I think it's really exciting to see that evolution finally come to fruition. And they'll want to, you know, keep that momentum and keep that winning run going. Um, and no better game to do it than the, against the the Pro 14 champions and, and a team that they've struggled against in, in recent years. So, of course, the rivalry remains as strong as ever, irrespective of whether they're full teams or not, and you, you do not want to lose at home. Brian, just to, to discuss that for a second, this, the current state of the Irish provinces, um, when you see that great win for Munster at the weekend, Leinster winning handily without really hitting fifth gear, Ulster and Connacht improved performances from them as well, albeit disappointing losses in the end. but. Uh, should we all be pretty optimistic about the, the current state of the Irish provinces? I know it goes up and down and comes in waves, but uh, where each of the four teams are at at the moment, should we be fairly optimistic? Yeah, I think in particular where where Connacht and Ulster are, and um, and and this, you know, I certainly don't want to sound patronising, but in reality, the the order has been more recently has been you know Leinster, Munster, Ulster, and Connacht, but. When you look at the consistency again of the performances, even in defeat of Ulster over the last two weekends, uh, the way they played in King's home, the way they fought back, it's not always about the style, but it's about the mentality of of being out of the game, but then finding a way to get yourself back in it. And albeit they lost in that last play of the game and they'll be devastated at the at the end result. I think it's the attitude shift that uh, and a, an ability to stay in the fight longer is 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 the improvements that I've seen in Ulster, um, and likewise, you know, Connacht. How many teams over in Racing have have scared um, the home team in La Defense Arena? You know, with those last couple of plays of the game where they ultimately could have lost it, um, where I think they they were eighteen points behind. Um, Racing didn't score in the second half or didn't score for thirty five minutes. That, that's that's a pretty impressive. Um, you know, a, a game plan to bring to somewhere like Paris and, and have the ability to put it into full effect against one of the most attritional teams. So they're thinking their way around 
um, problems being thrown at them. And I think, you know, credit to Dan McFarland and Andy Friend. I think they've got their teams playing to the strengths of the individuals and they're not the most powerful teams. So they've got to think their way around um, manipulating defenses and you know playing uh, a really clever kicking game. And I think in Jack Carty and Billy Burns, they've got two good operators in that regard. So huge kudos to those two and, and hopefully um, Munster and, and Leinster, even though Leinster had a slight dip in form maybe by their standards at the weekend, can continue um, driving the standards and it, and it can feed positively into the international team. Can I just ask you briefly about uh, the incident, I guess, at the RDS, which which caught most of the headlines on uh, the weekend. Uh, Tom Wood's tackle on Josh van der Fleer with 10 minutes to play. I mean, Keith Wood was on the show earlier in the week and he said it's a straight red card all day long. What was your view on, on that particular incident? Yeah, listen, I've come, I've come in for a bit of stick on it myself. And it's funny, you know, I, fi I find myself... Um, so conflicted in 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 my view at times, and so, and and I find myself almost contradicting some of the things I say because you know behind the scenes I work for international rugby players and I'm in communication uh, via them with World Rugby about trying to work out the high tackle framework. Um, it feels slightly different in in actual tackling and 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 the rook whether those two things need to be refereed the same or differently. Um, I'm obviously part of the Rugby World Cup board, so I'm close quarters to World Rugby from, from that perspective. Um, but I'm a big advocate of the game and player safety. So uh, I guess what, what I called at the time, the initial, my initial feeling on the incident was, oh, that's not good. And then when I looked at it and it's, and it's broken down, I had sympathy for Tom Wood um, because I've been in that situation and because the target is so tiny. And we're potentially coming into new a new realms or a new part of the game where we're going to look at a picture in, at a rook and realize there's no positive place for you to hit it. So you're just going to have to leave it alone and let a player steal the ball. Um, the reality is, if you look back on it and by the letter of the law, shoulder contact to a jaw with force, um, is there mitigation? Probably not. It is a red card, but yet, I, I, I can't help but have sympathy for him because if there's no target, he goes into a video session on a Monday and said, well, I, you know, I had no target. I didn't want to get sent off. She's, you know, that, that doesn't sit well with any professional either. And it's, you know, there's, there's been out, uh, out, uh, outrage, you know, on social media and stuff about um, how this is the most clear cut red card of all time. It's interesting talking to different factions of you know within the game you know i talked to a number of ex players and so many could understand the sympathy part um and and you know josh you know didn't wasn't protect himself some people were like does he have a duty of care to protect himself in that situation as well i i think ultimately because of where we're at in the game now it, it you know in, in in on reflection it is a red card because we need to outlaw shoulders to the head, directly to the head. However, I do think it it's, uh, creates another issue um, within the game where we're going to have to have passive rooks. Maybe similarly to players having to pull out of tackles because they're worried about high shots. We're going to have players pulling out of rooks and just having to let the jackter steal the ball because there's no active point for them to make a collision that's going to be legal, that's going to give them an opportunity of winning the ball back. And maybe that's where the game is going, but it, it just feels as though there's potential that it's going to sanitize the game slightly. But if that's for the, you know, for the safety of the game, maybe that's how, where we have to go. But it's 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 a it's it's a it's a red card by the letter of the law. It is because it's shoulder to the head. But it felt maybe a few years ago that it was a, a rugby collision that. Ugh, you know, is tough to to see someone getting a red card for because you look at red cards, red card in the New Zealand um, Argentina game a few weeks back, where the loose uh, the sub prop came in and um, cleared a rook where a, a player was lying prone and he hit him straight in the head. He he was motionless. That's for me foul play red card. Tom Wood doesn't lose his feet, gets a good position, gets his body height a fraction off his target, unfortunately makes collision. It just, they, they, for me, those two don't quite add up and, and quantify to the, to the same penalty.
but I guess we'll find out more with World Rugby. There's so many conversations going on behind the scenes that it feels that we're in a really precarious place at the minute. Ryan, you mentioned about Connacht at the weekend and they lost out to their old head coach, Pat Lamb, and the Bristol Bears in Galway. 27-18, it finishes now. Paul Boyle, young captain for Connacht, puts his hands up afterwards. He said he made a terrible mistake. They were in kickable range where potentially they could have got that game back to six points. Would have boosted their chances of playing European rugby in the new year because they would have been well-placed to qualify for the Challenge Cup. Leaving that point behind might prove to be pretty costly for them. But I presume this is a very important learning moment for Boyle as captain. Yeah, it is. And, and, and I wouldn't, you know, castigate him for it. You know, you're, sometimes you, you get lost in the, in the moment when, you know, emotions are high and you're new to the job as well. Um, and, you know, it's, it's funny when I was looking, um, looking at it, I was like, well, what are they talking about? I wasn't even thinking that way. You just... So you sometimes get in the mentality you want to finish the game as strong as you can by scoring and, and, and building the momentum for the next game of finishing on a high rather than finishing on a low. Uh, and he tried to you know get a five-pointer out of it, even though three would have gotten that bonus point. They weren't winning the game, but with, with getting a, a, an additional kick, it would have given them something from the game. But you do, you learn from these experiences. He's relatively inexperienced. Um, but yeah, he's he's held. All you can ask for is is someone is to to appreciate that they got got it wrong. And we all make errors. And potentially, you know, I, I think I could have gotten it wrong at, at the weekend. I I hold my hands up and go, yes, by the letter of the law, that's a that's a red card. And um, doesn't mean you can't have sympathy or can't have a grievance of some sort. But um, but I think he's held his hands up and gone. Listen, that's. You know that's a bad bad call for me. I'm sorry about that. You know you can sure be sure that he'll fight even harder in the next game. So you live and learn. Provided you don't make that mistake a second time, um, you know you you um, what is it? You you win or you learn. Yeah. Brian, can I just ask you one from from left field a little bit? So, um, and I know as a dub you mightn't have much sympathy for for Mayo other other footballers after the weekend, but uh, when when you look at that Mayo team. Um, and the near misses they've had. And to be fair now, during your Leinster career, you'd have to dig fairly deep to find a period of um, uh, lack of dominance, I guess. But that kind of era from 04 to, to 07 or so, when you know there were Celtic League near misses and, and European Cup exits at the quarterfinal and semifinal stage, how difficult is it for a team like Mayo um, you know, to, to keep going back to the well again, from a psychological point of view, to, to, to finding that motivation to, to keep going? No doubt, it's very difficult. And yeah, we might have had that period. I'd even extend it back probably. You know, we won uh, the the Celtic League as it was in 2001 against Munster, which was a really, which almost was acted as a negative because, you know, we didn't understand the hard work and graft that was necessitated to continually win trophies year on year or compete year on year. Um, so I think that worked against us. Where, so, but you know, we started losing semi-finals in 2003 um, through to 2007. All right, but you know, to look at the extended period that Munster or that Mayo have have struggled, it it, it must be soul destroying at times. Going back into preseason, knowing that you've been so close, but the unfortunate aspect is that you know teams are cyclical, and you know where a team has shown brilliant form for three, four seasons, then have a drop off or the you know, players retire. That hasn't been the case with, with Dublin. Whereas year on year, they see the squad grow. And I think that's the deflation that, the, that, that comes with the reality that it's going to be as hard the next year, or if not harder. And getting yourself up for finals is not a difficult thing to do, but you know, it, the subconscious does eat away at you in some way where it's like, is this ever going to be? Are we ever going to break the seal on this one? And even as a as a, a dub fan, you know, I've got huge sympathy for them because they they're worthy of a, an All Ireland medal. They, you know, it's the least that this group of players deserve. But they've just come up uh, in a moment in time against a phenomenal outfit that are relentless in what they do and. And any hole seems to be plugged by an even better player. So um, it's it's difficult to go back to this drawing board. And the only upside is that they don't have to, 
languish for a full uh, winter this time round, that the championship will come around a little bit quicker, a bit like McElroy and the Masters. Um, so w with a bit of luck, you know, we'll see a continuation of, you know, underage players having the enthusiasm to try and break this bloody curse. Well, as you say, they're back training on the 15th of January. It's going to come around very quickly. Brian, thanks a million for joining us on OTBAM, and hopefully it's a very Merry Christmas in the O'Driscoll household. Thanks a lot. Cheers, guys. OK, well, Offaly Chairman Michael Dygan will be joining us next here on OTBAM. But first, let's hear from Fergal McGill, the GA's Director of Player, Club and Games Administration. I asked him yesterday about the composition of the coming 2021 GA season. Yeah, I think so, Will. Look, we, we didn't have as much time available to us this year as we would normally have with the championship finishing um, so late this year. So we wanted to provide a proper downtime for, for counties. Um, so that, that had ate into the time available. And then at the, at the other end, we wanted to make sure there was time enough for the club game. So uh, I suppose the big thing we're happy about is to see the Provincial and All-Ireland Club Championships uh, being back in there. And we do think we've created... Um, a, a, a very good window for club competitions uh, during summer. So, yeah, I, I would say overall we're, we're pretty happy. Um, I think it's a better games programme than the one we had in, in 2020. I definitely think there's a little bit extra in there. So hopefully it all works well. Look, I won't have escaped any of your attentions that this is a split season uh, in, in 2021. It's the first time um, we'll have a proper split season last year. Uh, or the year gone by this year, <clears throat> it wasn't really a proper split season insofar as we started with county, went back to club and finished with county. So this year uh, will be different. It's going to be very interesting to see how it how it pans out. But yeah, I think I think it's going to have huge positive benefits for the club game, um, without a doubt. I think if you took a short term view at this, you would say, well, there's no guarantee we'll be able to play club games in the first quarter of the year because, as I say, we're not allowed to do them now. So, uh, yes, uh, that certainly was it in the short term. But if we look at the longer term and if the GA are going to uh, bring in a split season and it will be on the agenda for Congress in February, um, I think the right decision is still to put the county game first. And there's a couple of reasons for that because if you ran with the club game first, um, you would end up probably having to play county finals in at the end of April, uh, the early part of May, because then you have to run the Provincial and Ireland Club Championships. So um, that would have been very early for, for the flagship team in every club to be finished their activity. And we don't think that would have been um, we don't think that would have been a good approach. Uh, there would have been less appetite for clubs to play in in leagues or non championship competitions. Once they're once they're eliminated from the county championship, and then the the third obvious thing is that if you ran with club first, well then towards the end of the club season, the inter county game with their return to training would be eating into um, would be eating into into the the time available for 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 clubs. So for all those reasons, we think county first is is, is a no brainer to be quite honest. There you go. Fergal McGill, a no-brainer, he called it, that decision to go with county before club for the coming season. So it means, in effect, county teams can come back for collective training from the 15th of January. The Alliance Football and Hurling Leagues will resume then on the last week of February. And it means that a championship will then take place between April and July. The All-Ireland Finals, the football will be on the weekend of the 11th and the hurling on the weekend of the 19th, which then frees up a club calendar from late July until December to get to the All-Ireland Club semi-final stage and then the final of the All-Ireland Football and Hurling Club Championships will be played in early 2022. We're joined now by the Offaly County Board Chairman Michael Dignan. Michael, good morning to you. Good morning, lads. Uh, what Fergal McGill was saying there, Michael, is pretty much broadly in line with what you were welcoming and hoping would happen with the season when you were speaking at Offaly Convention last week. Uh, so I'd imagine you're happy enough with what the GA have settled on. Um, yeah, look, I think it's um, it'll take a bit of time to see how it goes, but I think it's it brings a lot of clarity. We saw it last year with the club window, you know, uh, was how positive that was for for I think for every community across the country to have all your county players, to know you have them at all age groups, not just at senior level. I think it made a huge difference to the standard of training within clubs, and I think um, it, you know, just fantastic to see what it brought uh, to, to back to the clubs, I suppose. Um, Long term, 
I think we'll have to give it a year or two, you know, and see how the split season goes. It's going to be very hard to judge anything in the future, obviously, with, with COVID, because we don't know where we're going to go in the early part of the year. Logistically, it's going to be very difficult, as it has been. But I think when we get back to normal, or uh, hopefully in, in the next year or two, it'll be very interesting to see how it works out. The only concern I'd have is, I suppose, is what Fergal said there, is it'll be very early for your for your um, club team to be out in April. And I suppose it's the same thing, will it be very early for our county teams to be out in July because you want to be carrying the GA in the second half of the year with your club game. And that, so that's, I think it's far better than what we've had and it's we, we, we had no choice but go this way. Now, when it comes to the inter-county season itself, Michael, Ferg McGill also admitted that, you know, financially it probably would have made more sense to push for just the one year that's in it, the county back to the second half of the year again, with their hope that there'll be some fans allowed back into stadiums in the second half of the season. He said, though, that in the end, they looked at the overall welfare of players across the country and it made more sense not to play club first. I guess a big consideration, I know you would have been looking at these recommendations in recent weeks too, is that when we look at what could potentially happen with the levels going back up from the government later on today, it would have been very difficult to actually play club championship at the turn of the year anyway. It would have been impossible. Um, you know, as it is, um, I think this might be a little bit underestimated uh, by people and how difficult it actually is for our county teams. And, and I think our players um, deserve so much credit over the last number of months, our inter-county players, for the efforts they put in. You know, one of the great things being a player in junior championship season, and I was, I was lucky enough to be there for a long time, you know, it was playing championship um, the day of the match. Just small things, travelling together on the bus, having a bit of crack in the dressing room, you know, after the match, maybe with, after a championship win, brilliant to go back and maybe meet your family and friends and, and relax that evening. Um, all that was taken away. Like, it, it, was, it was quite soulless in ways going to championship matches last, you know, over, over the winter. Um, we went to we went to Newry a couple of weeks in a row with herders, maybe forty cars in convoy up the road, stopping in a garage on one of the days to, to try to get a bit of food. There's in an outdoor car park, um, getting to the match. You know, it's, it's not I suppose what, what what people sign up for, but players didn't mind, they didn't complain, they just wanted to play and were willing to make the sacrifices. Um, but it was it, it was very difficult, and you couldn't just do that at club level. Um, and and the financial argument is very valid for the GA at national level, which obviously they're losing a huge amount of money. But I think the only advantage financially is that at least if we get you know, maybe the vaccine um, in, maybe in place during the year, maybe for our club games at the second half year, we will have maybe be able to let our crowds back in. And that could give each county board a massive boost because if we got, I think there's a huge appetite out there for the club game. So we actually could have bumper club season at least maybe allow counties to get back um you know in, into a good financial position so you know i think nationally yeah, there's big challenges for the ga you know they may have to borrow going forward but i think in the long term they'll be well able to carry it you know, they've proven that before carrying debt or, and i think the government you know will, will, will be in the background there all along as well so i think we get through the financial end of it but i suppose it's it's about trying to keep the games going for now and the only way you could do it is it, as the inter-county players allow travel and allow play as an elite sportsman, it's the only thing you could have started with. Yeah, I feel for some of the players, Michael, who are still waiting for their 2020 semi-finals and finals to be completed in some counties where you know the plug had to be pulled, uh, in some cases, six or seven days before a county final was due to be played uh, back in late September. Things have been in limbo. Uh, those players, realistically, I know Fergal McGill mentioned yesterday that you know, January is there potentially uh, for those club fixtures to be completed for 2020 that are outstanding. But you know, realistically, with the levels about to jump up again, it could well be next summer before some of those finals are actually completed. Could be well. We were one of those counties, obviously, as you know yourself. Um, we look, it was very disappointing. We lost the three weeks as well with the second lockdown with Els Kildare and Leach um at that particular time. And we had, you know, that, that really uh, that's all we needed was another week, and it was so frustrating. Um another week just to get our our, our senior hurling final played, but there was other underage finals as well. Um, but look, I suppose our CCC will have to meet very early in the new year, looking at the way things are, looking at you know, even what we heard last night about restrictions coming back in from maybe Christmas Eve. You know, it's, it's not looking good at the minute. So I think to be fair to our club uh, players, we're going to have to be decisive and make the call. Um, as you look, know, as, as you know how the GA works, it, it's not a call for me, it's a call for a CCC. But you're you're dragging it on and looking at the county season then when it's going to be leagues are going to be starting at the end of February. So the window is getting very small now. So um, it, it, it could be that the 
matches are deferred for, for a number of months. Mm. Um, as you mentioned, the inter-county season is going to look a little bit different uh, this year too. I'm interested, like just as a former All-Ireland hurling winner yourself, and you would have played in Leinster Championship for many years, how you feel about this uh, structure for the hurling next year? Because the round robin isn't going to return. It's still going to be a knockout championship at Leinster senior level and same at Munster. But to me, it seems very unfair on the face of it that Munster has no relegation guaranteed that all five counties uh, will still be in the championship for 2022. Yet Leinster have set up a situation where you've got Galway and Kilkenny seeded. The other four teams will play in quarterfinals with in all likelihood Leash and Antrim probably losing those quarterfinals and then having to face a relegation playoff for the McDonough Cup. Is it fair, Michael, the fact that Leinster feels more like a development division that Munster is entirely protected? Well, I would have thought, the first thing I'd say is that if Kerry had won the, the draw McDonough, I think that they couldn't play a Munster in the shambles, to be honest with you. You know, I think that they have to be let into Munster at Astor Province, and that should have been the prize, but that didn't happen. Um, look, it's the way it developed, um, Will, with, I suppose, with Galway being out on the outside for so long, you know, that wasn't ideal. Um, at that particular time, the decision was made for them to go into Leinster, um, and you know, I think in, in some ways it's benefited Leinster in that it made it much more competitive that I suppose at that particular time Kilkenny were, were winning Leinster every single year and Galway have added spice in Dublin obviously have come and Wexford have improved since so you know I suppose it, it, the decision was made in, in, at a different time but it, it is becoming a bit of a farce to me you know that that, that, that everything everything is is going through Leinster and that's where all the all the I suppose the, as you said the development is going on but at the same time um, you know, these things, I suppose, are changing and moving all the time. We have to look at, and it'll be interesting, that's what I'm saying about the inter-county season, because the reason we changed away from the knockout competition originally, and I suppose I started off my career playing, many years playing knockout championship, and in ways it was brilliant, because, you know, if you got if, if you did beat a Kilkenny um, in the Leinster semi-final, you were gone for the year, but if you got beaten yourself, and it happened, I think, three years in a row in 91, 2 and 3, we were beaten in the first round, um, early enough and we were on for the year so it was a whole year of training for one match and that was the, the negative side of it but what we've seen I suppose is that there's a balance there I think keeping teams in the championship for too long is as bad because you're you're eventually going to maybe get, get that beaten somewhere along the way and some of them have been pretty bad in the, in the qualifiers uh, as we've seen so I think it's that balance between giving players inter-county players um, a, a good amount of matches and, and balancing that knockout element of the competition and you know, so, so it, I'm more and more coming down to the national leagues that quality of the matches, the competition, the level being the same. That we may be looking at in the future a move in something like that. I think, particularly in football, where we see in the four divisions that you know, the quality of matches from division one to four um, is brilliant and the matches are exciting and there's very little between them because teams are, are, are at the same level. So, I think over the next number of years, that's something that we really have to look at is, is, is that sort of camping. Champions League sort of championship like format that after six or seven matches maybe in the championship um, uh, uh, on a league basis and, uh, and and maybe that would carry it um, from the spring right to the summer. Uh, Michael, just on the football end of things, and I know this is something you've been tweeting about in, in recent days, but uh, I guess the Dublin football juggernaut rolled on um, on Saturday evening at Croke Park and, uh, you know, that argument that some people in some quarters, whether it be Dublin X players, fans, current players, um, this argument that money makes no difference to the to the Dublin success in recent years. What what's your reaction when you hear that uh, that argument from some quarters? Well, look, look, I'll be honest. I'm totally frustrated at this stage with it and annoyed. And that's my, my tweet. You're right. Was was in no way um, aimed at the Dublin players' uh, success. Uh, there's some of the greatest players of all time. We don't have to go through them all here now. But even Cluxton, who's Again, James McCarthy is probably one of my favourite players of all time, if not my favourite. And the many, many brilliant players that would have been brilliant players, I think, regardless. And this argument, money doesn't help you kick it over the bar, and money doesn't you know, win tight matches. I think they're missing the point uh, completely. Um, in terms of, if you look at it, we're supposed to be an amateur organisation, and, um, and and I don't want to be seen to be whinging here from Offaly's point of view. I think we have to help ourselves as well. I think a huge part of our development in the future will be down to us having a sustainable fundraising arm attached to the county board. You have to get in your own money if you want to grow. But what Dublin did was, or what the GA did was, they reached out and helped Dublin back in whatever, 2006 or seven. Sean Kelly has spoken about it. And that particular time, the GA in Dublin wasn't in good shape, as we all know. And it was important for the GA 
that it was in much in a much better position. So they got in and they helped Dublin. What Dublin have done with that has been amazing. And if, if you take it from the top, where they started with, with John Costello coming in as the CEO, who's done a fantastic job. Um, I don't know if people realise this, but the only grant from Crow Park available to the full-time staff is to give every county €30,000 a year. Now, if you take our situation off, we have an operations manager. That's our only full-time staff. And by the, by the nature of the title, operations is you're dealing with day-to-day. They've replaced maybe the role of the secretary years ago um, with the heavy lifting on a day-to-day basis. That's not going to give you the vision and the strategic uh, platform to grow your county the way Dublin did. So Dublin have a CEO. Uh, they have a commercial manager, they have a full-time strength and condition manager, they have lots of administrative staff. Um, I don't know exactly how many staff to have. And that's only on that side. And the, the only thing they get towards that from, from GEA is 30 grand a year, the same as the rest of us. Now, that's not going to go very far. Um, they have the resources then to obviously support that. And that's before you start looking at the coaching side where Dublin have. I don't know how many GPOs in Dublin, maybe some, maybe yourself or, or will do, but I think it could be anywhere in the region of 80 or 90. It's hard to get an answer on that one when you ask it. I know there's one club that have four. Uh, we started the year in Offaly with four full-time coaching staff. We're down to two uh, because of the uh, left. So, we've, so as a, as a, we're probably reflective of a lot of the smaller counties in that we've one full-time staff and we've a couple of coaching staff and we're taking on this. So we need. So the point I'm making is Dublin got their support and they needed it. We don't need it now. They made 2.7 million profit last year under operations and fair play to them. And fair play to the players for whatever they can make out of the game commercially. But my point is that other counties like ourselves need support now. Yes, we need to support ourselves. Yes, we need to go out there and raise money. Dublin have done that. But if we, okay, and we have either success the fact that the, the sort of sponsorship deal that we could really dream about with the AIG, um, for, the four million over five years, I think that would take us about 80 years for our county sponsor um, to bring in. So early, early, early I suppose, the realities of it. There's also population and all those things that weren't a factor. And I would ask the question, people say no one was complaining when Dublin weren't winning. They weren't, I would say no, we need to support Dublin. to be a huge population. We need to grow the game there. And that was done. And I think it was justifiably done. But I think now it's very evident that Dublin don't need the support. I, I just did a quick sum. I think from 2007 um, to this year, Dublin got about 20 million in central funding. There, thereabouts. We got about a million quid in Offaly. And I suppose that would be reflective of the cost of um, so I think Dublin have got their support, um, but I, I don't think they need it anymore. I think they can sustain themselves, and I think we need to look at. And I think not admitting that looks to me to be so weird that if anybody thinks that money doesn't make a difference, you know, you're living on another planet. Of course it does. Uh, Michael, and, and not to labour the point, but uh, with the ladies winning, you know, four in a row at the weekend, and we've seen the improvements, the vast improvements uh, in Dublin hurling at minor under twenty and senior level over the last number of years. Do you foresee a situation within the next number of years where we see six in a rows at all age grades uh, and all levels for Dublin GEA? Well, that, that that is a possibility, but I think that's what I'm saying is we, we need. I'm not involved in the off the job uh, to accept that Dublin are going to win every All Ireland or that like Kenny were going to beat us when I was a player or anything else like that. You have to be ambitious and you have to help yourselves. And I, and I suppose what we need to do in Offaly, it's a much smaller county, is we need to build our structures. We need to put it for the big challenges that we have in Offaly this year, and that COVID is really killing us in terms of doing this. But we have to establish a sustainable long term culture model, which is based on the GPO model that Dublin have. And I'd like to see by the end of this year us having seven or eight GPOs on the ground. And we're meeting in Leinster on the 13th of January to try to get that going. We need to do some serious fundraising ourselves. Um, it's not a good time for Leinster or Central GA to support us. Um, but when we get back to norm, I think we have to look at the model. And look, it is. It is a possibility, and Dublin have got to act together. So we have to, we have to get up there. You can't. Dublin is not going to stop now. Um, was it fair? I, I don't think it was. I think it was uh, it was let go too far. Um, other counties were let lag behind. But some of that we have to take responsibilities as counties. Did we stand up and shout and fight for ourselves? Did we do anything about it? No is probably the answer at a large extent. But this fobbing off, I think that goes on. Like Dublin, Dublin are a very very powerful brand, and if you challenge Dublin players. You challenge the Dublin, you know, you know yourself, you're in the media up there. It's very difficult. It's a, they're a difficult questions to ask. And I don't hear them asked too often. I don't I hear them asked of the president of GA, of Tom Ryan, or of Dublin players. They're writing articles every week in the paper and they're saying it makes no difference. The money makes no difference. Well, it does, lads. It makes a big, big difference. And um, I'm finished with G this morning. I have to go off and do three or four hours of a few meetings with GA related. 
and then I have to get back to the night and I run my own business as well. And we've we've one staff member who's up to his eyes with the operations and day to day business. We're fully dependent on volunteers and public having full time special staff um, behind them. It has to make a massive difference. Well, Michael, before you go to those meetings, Dublin aren't in either of the Leinster minor finals this season, but Offaly are in both. I would imagine at the tail end of your first year as chairman, you must be delighted to have Offaly in both Leinster minor football and hurling finals coming up now in the first weekend of January. A few green shoots for your county there. Yeah, look, it's, it's massive, Will. It's, um, just last weekend to get the boost, I was in Newbridge on Saturday um, in Mullingar on Sunday with, with at the two matches and... Um, it does. It gives you. It gives you great hope, and it's just for the. It's, it's again about those players, their families. I, I love the way the honesty about them. Um, look, the two massive challenges, and not being, uh, you know, political about this, but forget about the, the you know, the Kenny and the hurling and the meat and the football and the meat and the and stuff. Makes them favourites, but just just for the lift, I think it, it gave everybody. There's a there's a huge honesty to the setups there, and you know, very lucky with and Furlong is involved with the manager of the minor footballers, and, and obviously a great. A, a, um, great family tradition and his son playing and their son uh, son and grandson of Martin Furlongs and Paul Daly is there with him and Stephen Lonergan from Burr and they're all Stephen and Corey Kelly's giving them a hand out and, uh, and Leo Connor's coming off from Limerick people looked at that probably as a strange appointment that I would we go to Limerick for somebody but Leo's done a fantastic job and he was very involved with the, the Limerick academies you know so brought a lot of experience he brings the calmness to it as well but the way the players have bought in and I think with the faithful fields you know Maybe it's beginning to show its value, um, because it's the one, you know, one thing we have in Offaly is we have fantastic facilities, and um, people were critical maybe of the development of O'Connor Park. It has left us with a debt. I was involved as the chair of the fundraising in O'Connor Park, and I chaired the finance in Bedford Field as well, which we managed to build debt free. We had to. That was one of the things we said we can't bring more debt on the county. We didn't, and we achieved it debt free. But it does take a lot of money to run it. That's the next stage of it. You know, the actual maintenance of O'Connor Park and fields and the debt on, on O'Connor Park. They're huge figures in, in an annual budget. But that's a different one. But I think to see the lads going out there, I think for everyone trying together, the, 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 the fantastic facilities we have out there, um, it gives us a base. You're not going around wondering where you're trying. And when you go out there, there's a total professionalism to the setup out there. Um, so look, it gives us a great place to work on, uh, Will. And, it, and look, I just loved it. I love this, like us all, for Christmas. I love this COVID to go away and get the vaccine up and running, just to give us a chance to... There's a great goodwill out there now towards Africa. We've always had great supporters. Um, you know, and we need our support now. We need our business community to come in behind us. We're, we we lost €270,000 last year, which to us is a massive sum. And we have to have to raise that money in the first four or five weeks of the new year if we're going to be able to stay going uh, next year. So... We have, a, we have a big year ahead of us, but at the same time, really looking forward to it and really looking forward to our two minor teams and Leicester fans. Yeah, plenty of work ahead. Michael, thanks a million for joining us this morning and uh, have yourself a very Merry Christmas as well. Same to you, lads. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Uh, approaching nine o'clock now, OTBM is live in association with Gillette. Good morning, start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the day ahead. A reminder of our competition as well here on OTBM this morning. You have a chance to win a great prize. A one-for-all gift card from your local post office is the perfect last-minute gift option for family, friends and colleagues ahead of Christmas. They will be available for purchase from post offices nationwide right up until pretty much the closing date to get your shopping done, which is 1pm on Christmas Eve. This morning, we are giving you the chance to win a €100 Euro one for all gift voucher uh, before 10 a.m. All you have to do to enter is to guess our mystery voice and WhatsApp your answer to 087 9180 180. That's 087 9180 180. Uh, let's get another chance to uh, listen to the mystery voice then. He's a physical monster. He does all his work every single day. He's a handful in and around the box as well. Maybe it's not Conor Callan. Maybe this is talking about James McCarthy. Let's just hear the clip one more time there. He's a physical monster. He does all his work every single day. He's a handful in and around the box as well. All right. The chance to win that €100 Euro one for all gift voucher uh, before 10 a.m. this morning. All you have to do is WhatsApp your name and the answer to that question to 087 9180 180 and we'll do the draw uh, just before 10 a.m. Now, the Dublin ladies footballers have created a little bit of history themselves. They have won four All-Ireland titles in a row. A victory against Cork in Sunday's final at Croke Park by one goal and 10 points to one goal and five. So Mick Bowen's side, uh, the champions lifting the Brendan Martin Cup uh, 
for the fourth time in succession. Uh, I think we should be able to go across now to Carla Rowe, who scored uh, the goal for Dublin at Croke Park at the weekend. Are you there, um, Clara? Yeah, I am indeed. Good morning. How ah. are you? There we go. The joys of live production happening in the background. Um, my congratulations, <laughs> for, first of all, on the success. I was just having a look through earlier on. You're into your 25th year now at this point, and you have played in seven successive All-Ireland finals. And while the first three might have been disappointments and coming up short, uh, particularly against Sunday's opponents, Cork, you've now won four in a row. Yeah, I suppose I've uh, I've been very lucky to stumble upon the team that I have that every year I've played with the senior team we've got as far as an All-Ireland final. Yeah, those three years where we lost, but I suppose somewhere along the way you need to do some learnings and we did that and we've brought it forward to the last four years, thankfully. So it's it's been a great journey so far. Let's just have a look back on Sunday's game because I'd imagine that first half from a Dublin perspective has to feel pretty tense because Cork bang in a goal very early on. You guys have yeah. had a few chances and particularly a couple of decent goal chances which aren't taken. You find yourselves three points down at half time. What was the feeling in the dressing room at half time, Carla, about uh, how you'd played in that first half? <laughs> to be honest, within players, it was a little bit of frustration because we knew we were in the game and we were there and we were just missing by inches. So there was a no way kind of panic. Um, at no stage did I feel panicked about it. I know at one point during the game, I looked up to the scoreboard and I saw that we were three points down and a good bit of time had already gone. So that was a bit of a, right, we need to we need to get this together now at this stage. But in the dressing room, it was all quite calm. Um, we discussed points and that it was basically our composure. We were lacking the final inches of composure. And I think that was just the energy that was there in the team for um, the last couple of weeks that's been building and bubbling, I suppose, that we probably weren't just playing with cool heads. We were pan we were just not being too composed in that last decision. So um, we addressed that. We uh, discussed a few other points. And we knew in the second half, if we got that right, we could go out there and we'd, we'd hopefully do the job. The turnaround then is pretty much, well, at least the, the big fulcrum is your penalty. Six minutes into the second half, uh, you get the chance to put the ball into the net in front of the hill. Uh, tell me about your penalty um, technique here too, because I was thinking this is very Neymar-esque. Like you don't give the goalkeeper <laughs> much of a chance to guess which side you're going to go. You give it a couple of steps and then you obviously saw the goalkeeper had shifted her weight slightly to one side and into the bottom corner. It was funny. I had people slagging me from the penalty against Armagh saying I was I was risky, very soccer style. So, um, um, I suppose it was just being decisive. Um, I I knew they'd have done their homework on the penalties. I think I've had about five throughout the year with the league and uh, the two championship games. So, I think I've put three right and two left. Uh, so it was a case of being decisive on the day and. I preferred probably to go one side and she moved that way. So I put it the other side. It was just a case of kind of waiting and seeing and trusting my kick that if I knew I connected with the ball right and I focused on the ball, that it should go hopefully <laughs> into one of the bottom corners. I did wonder about that. When you step up and you're not giving yourself a massive run up in order to generate power, do you have a side in mind before you reach the ball or is it a case of right and going to wait and see what the goalkeeper does first? Um, well, for me, it was if I could go to the preferred side to go to that side, um, which would be the right-hand side. But I, I also was aware of the fact that if she moved to just take your time and slot it in the other side. So hopefully I'd been practicing both of those scenarios throughout the weeks. And so with, um, with Sinead Ahern and her hamstring, and she had said, look, make sure you're ready to go. So I'd been practicing that, and uh, it worked out on the day. There was a moment, though, when... When I got taken down and I had the penalty, I was sitting on the floor and I just said, OK, right, compose yourself here, take a breath and and just trust in what you've been doing all week. It proved to be a crucial moment in the game because Dublin go ahead at that stage and you don't surrender the lead. Ashley Maloney was saying to us on Off the Ball on Sunday when she was analysing the game for us that she said what was most impressive, and I'm sure you probably felt this on the field too, was that your team exerted control over the game for that last 25 minutes or so. Yeah, and that's what we were lacking in the first half. You know, we were kind of, I suppose you could nearly say we were doing a little bit of what we had done um, in the first three years against Cork. We were we were kind of letting the game run up and down the pitch with no control. So we addressed that at half time. We said we will control the game and we'll make sure that when the shot is on, we'll take the shot. The player in the best position will get the ball. And 
just to not be panicking as much. Um, so yeah, that, I suppose you just learned that over the years. Um, we didn't, we lacked that in the three years we lost. So if you don't learn from those loses, uh, losses, you probably don't deserve to win. So we made sure we brought that forward into our last four years. And um, I suppose you have to thank Mick Bowen for that one. He's, he's well able to know how to see a game out and finish it off. So we've definitely picked that up along the way. And I would imagine in terms of thanks as well, I saw your coach, Ken Robinson, saying overnight on Twitter that he won't be part of the management team for the potential run at five in a row for next year. He's been involved with you, I think, since 2017. How important has Ken been to the setup? Oh, uh, massive. Um, like, if you, I suppose you can see the shape of us yesterday. I know Ify Fitzgerald commented on our pace and our strength and that's just purely down to Ken. Although some days uh, we mightn't like seeing him in the winter and his cones going out to do runs and going to do strength work. But um, without Ken there, you know, you'd be looking at a different, a completely different team. You'd still have the football, but the strength and conditioning is the basis to being able to go out and play that brilliant brand of football. And uh, I, I'd always have loved Ken and got on very well with Ken. So uh, yeah, he'd be solely missed in the team, definitely. I'm not sure how many changes there are going to be. You know, Sinead Ahern said on the pitch after the game that she's going to take Christmas to think about whether she's going to be around for next year. As you mentioned, she got subbed off, was carrying that hamstring injury going into the game, was brought back on for the last few minutes by Mick. And naturally, then the questions after the game become, are you thinking about retiring now after uh, becoming the first captain to lift the Martin Cup for four years? If Sinead was to go, I don't know what she's going to do, but how important has she been for Dublin? I mean, she's been there now since 2004, has obviously been a key member of your forward line. What kind of teammate is Sinead Ahern? Uh, um, a one of a kind, I suppose. There's no words for for Sinead. Like, uh, the, I'd say she'll be the best, one of the best captains to ever come through that Dublin, that Dublin team. And I only said this to her yesterday that she would have been and still is my role model up there in the team, the way she goes about her business um, and even just the natural football that's oozing out of her. Um, she's a fantastic player and even better person. And she brought that team, you know, she brought that team together and she made some of the days where we weren't going as well. She was able to singly handedly turn it around for us. So um, she's a, a great person, great player. And um, I'm sure whatever, whatever her choice will be, we'll definitely give her the winter anyway to think over it. Uh, Carla, congrats on the weekend. Can I just ask you about the um, the psychology of going for four in a row? So uh, I guess you'd ask the same question of the men's team as well when, when, when they're going for their six, but does the pressure get more and more for the team year on year to, to keep that run going? Or, you know, given you've been there, done that, got the medals, are you slightly more relaxed uh, as each final and each year progresses? Um, I definitely wouldn't say we're more relaxed, but last year, I think there was quite a lot of focus on the three in a row because, you know, it's a big deal and the men were going as well. Whereas this year, I think because of the, the um, pandemic, I know inside our panel, we weren't thinking about four in a row. It was more the year that there has been that um, this one was for us was what we were saying that there are other years maybe it was it was for that three in a row and it was for that uh, back to back of Ireland whereas this one this year was the struggles that everyone has been through on the team and the management and everyone behind us and our families that that one we were focusing on it for us as players and managers so I don't think for me personally anyway the pressure wasn't there as much as for the four in a row as it was for the three in a row because we were trying to focus on ourselves as the team. Uh, and this is probably a two-parter question, but Ashley Maloney was also praising at the weekend, you know, the style, of this running football, defending from deep and and attacking. Um, uh, have you noticed teams mirroring your tactical approach in the last couple of years, given the success you've had? Uh, and I guess the second part of that question is, was it more special that it was Cork that you beat in the final, given the rivalry that's there? Um, yeah, with the tactical part, I think that's um, the way once football starts winning, you know, we saw that with the men as well. When Donegal started to win, we got the or got the All-Ireland, we got that brand of football. I think the men's game is the same where um, Dublin are controlling the game and I saw the likes of Cavan doing the same. So um, I suppose it is a little bit there in the ladies' football. Um, yeah, Waterford probably played that way. Armagh were playing a quick brand, fast brand of football as well. And so do Cork. You know, the way ourselves and Cork play, we play quite similar in we both love to have that open-ended game where it's a good spectacle of football. Um, yesterday or Sunday probably didn't get as much of that 
on the scoreboard, but you know, it was still a fast flowing game. So you probably will get that a little bit trying to mimic teams that are doing well. And I suppose that would just be any, any clever team. We'd be doing the same when Cork were winning. We were looking at what they were doing well to make sure we learned from them. Carly, you happy to have a Leinster Championship to look forward to next year because with Westmead getting relegated last season, it left Dublin as the only senior team left. I know 2020 was strange, so in a way you had to bridge a gap because of the pandemic anyway. But to have Mead back at senior level now for next year after their win on Sunday in the curtain raiser, it must be nice to actually have a Leinster Senior Championship actually take place in 2021. Yeah, um, I, I know we'll be delighted, yeah, because, you know, it is a big gap, that um, Leinster gap that, that wasn't there over the last year or so. So um, to be able to have a game in Leinster, and I, I know already it's going to be a great game against me. They're a fantastic team and a huge congratulations to them on uh, on finally winning. I think they're in the same boat as us. They had done the three in a row losses, um, so a well-deserved win for them. But yeah, the Leinster Championship will be will be brilliant. Be looking forward to that already, knowing that that will be there for us and that it's me, a good rivalry, a good team with some great players coming up. So um, looking forward to that. And just one final one for me uh, before we let you back into your day and to continue celebrating the win at the weekend. How thankful are you that this season actually got completed? Because you know, Mick Bone, your manager, was saying to us that he openly had reservations about fixtures getting back underway, uh, particularly when there was a prospect of lockdown after the redraw for the championship. Having just got through the last couple of months and got this completed, are you just thankful that you were able to play it out? Yeah, that's it, exactly. Just thankful that it went ahead and that... Do you know, there wasn't the risk with the with the Dublin team. And I said that throughout our training was so minimal. And our our management team, our doctor team, um, do you know, they did everything to make sure it was a safe place for us to be. And even the girls, there was girls taking ownership of it themselves. So thankful that it could go ahead and and that it ended <laughs> and, um, it ended well for us as well. And that, you know, just that the risks were so minimized that you were you felt safe and you felt happy to be going to training. And that was that was where Mick's main stance was on that. He he wanted to make sure no one was uncomfortable um, with us playing or in, a, in an uncomfortable position, having to come to training. And they did that so well. So just delighted we got to play and, and that we got the Brendan Martin back to Dublin again. Yeah, huge credit to the players uh, across the country for getting it completed out. Uh, final yeah. word is one of congratulations to you because we're going to be announcing our annual Off the Ball Stars Players of the Year on our Christmas Eve special here on OTBAM in a couple of days. Carla, I'm delighted to say we can reveal now at this point, slight spoiler, that you've been picked by <laughs> Ashton O'Reilly as the Player of the Year for the Ladies Football Championship. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you very much. That's a privilege. Um, God, I didn't expect that. <laughs> Uh, so I don't, I don't know whether the All-Stars are going to happen in your real life this year or they'll be on Zoom, but I'm sure this is just as prestigious as winning a TG Carter uh, All-Star in a few weeks' time, potentially. Uh, absolutely. You know, these things don't come around, uh, come around often and it's a privilege to be given any individual accolade. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm delighted. Thank you very much. I've got our congratulations again on that, also winning the four in a row. And hopefully you have a lovely Christmas before uh, turning around pretty quickly to begin that assault at a five in a row next year. Yeah, thanks very much. And you guys as well. Have a great Christmas, a happy new year and look forward and looking forward to chatting again in the new year. There you go. Dublin star Carla Rowe fresh off the back of scoring 1-3 in the All-Ireland Final at the weekend where they beat Cork by five points. Now still to come on OTB Sports Radio today at 1pm we've got some OTB goals sticking with ladies football Mayo legend Cora Staunton. At 2pm the split season episode one which we're going to be talking about in a few moments time uh, which is by Sean Reedy and Graham O'Toole. Dagcast is at 3pm. Mount Rushmore is County Meath at 4pm and then at 6pm we've got some OTB gold which is Philly McMahon uh, speaking to Keith Andrews. And then you've got Off the Ball Live from 7 p.m. Back after these, we will have the co creators of The Split Season, which is the new GA documentary, which will be airing on OTB across Christmas. OTB AM. This is OTB Sports Radio. Off the Ball. I you joke about it now, I can count on the, like, the number of times you've actually told me you're proud of it. I praise. I... Oh, it's the truth. My father, it was only when he was dying in um, Wexford Hospital um, 19 years ago and he said to me, my cousin was there that he was proud of me that he never he never said it no, are we blaming we're not blaming no, you but we're blaming <laughs> granddad <laughs> I, can I officially say I'm proud of him but I'm proud of my daughter <laughs> thanks dad off the ball weeknights from 7 and weekends from 1 this 
is OTB Sports Radio. Now you're welcome along. It is Scoreboard Jungle. This is our GAA quiz. We have been running them right across the Intercounty Championship at these road shows. As things stand, our leaders are all on 10 points. Dr. Con Murphy of Cork, Nola Leary of Cork and Claire Egan of Mayo to uh, see if he can beat 10. And this is our final contestant actually this year. So we have Stephen Rochford. Hello. Joe, how are you? Good. Pressure's on. This is very simple. You get uh, round one is take your points. Five questions. 30 seconds, one point per correct answer, if that all makes sense. Yeah, okay. Okay, rock and roll. Your time starts now. So in this year's championship, how many goals have Mayo scored? Eight. Mayo reached how many All-Ireland finals between 2010 and 2019? Five, including the replay. Excellent. Killian O'Connor has won how many All-Stars? One. What is the most amount of goals Mayo have scored against Dublin in a single championship match? Three. Name the last Mayo captain to lift Sam. Sean Flanagan. Oh, you've done well. You've done well. How many goals have Mayo scored in this year's championship? Eight. That was good. That was quick thinking. And Mayo contested how many All-Ireland finals between 2010 and 19? I was worried, just as we were about to start, I said, what about the replays? And uh, you put all our fears to bed there. You were dead right. It's four, but five, including... Uh, replay. Killian O'Connor has won how many All Stars? One. That's a disgrace, by the way, isn't it? Tur terrible. <laughs> He's only at the championship's all time top scorer. Mm -hmm. Scorer, yeah. Uh, what is the most amount of goals Mayo have scored against Dublin in a single championship match? We had one. Right. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah. 2015, the drawn game, right? No. That's what I was sort of gone on. But maybe not. Maybe not. We'll double check. I don't think so. Dublin certainly yeah, scored I probably three don't. late. Yeah. Uh, and then you were right with Sean Flanagan. That is a very tidy four out of five. So that is... Uh, That'll be enough to beat Ryan McHugh, I mean, which is all is, is the important thing. Uh, easily, easily. Uh, round two is going for goal. So basically, this is, uh, this is where uh, you'll, you'll make it or break it. Each correct answer is worth three points. However, if you get a question wrong, it is finito, sudden death over. So answer carefully. Ready to go? There's no clock on no clock on this. There's 30 seconds on this as well, just to just to keep keep manners on you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Your time starts now. Which Dublin player was sent off in the 2017 All Ireland final? John Small. Correct. Before Killian O'Connor, which player had scored the highest tally in a single game of the 2020 championship? Five, four. Dean Rock. Lucky. I would have guessed the same. Jordan Morris scored three, four for me against Wichon. Oh, That's yeah. a tough one. No. That is a yeah. very respectable seven points. I think that puts you just in behind the leader. So you leave with no shame. That's all right. No <laughs> shame, yeah. N not at the bottom. OTB. Sports Radio. We've got a panel who know a thing or two about being trailblazers. Paul Rouse. Sport was already kind of impeded upon. Sinead Kassan. Does an innate interest in it anyway. Dermot Ling. It didn't blow me away with him. Jason Sherlock and Kieran Donaghy with us. Basketball would have been my main game. Retro panel for you now. This is OTB Sports Radio. The Retro Panel. Wednesdays and Thursdays from 4. OTB AM. With Gillette. We don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette made of what matters. Yeah, very decent effort by Stephen Rochford there, sitting comfortably in the middle of the table. That was the final episode of this season of Scoreboard Jungle as part of our coverage of the All-Ireland Senior Football Championship with thanks to Super Value Support, where you're from. We have a tie at the top. Mayo's Claire Egan, Cork's Noel O'Leary and the legendary Dr. Con Murphy all on 10 points. Now, your final chance to enter the Mystery Voice competition today, a one-for-all gift card from your local post office, the perfect last-minute gift option for family, friends and colleagues 
colleagues this Christmas. They will be available to purchase from post offices across the country until 1pm on Christmas Eve. This morning we're giving you a chance to win a €100 Euro one for all gift voucher, a possible last minute solution for someone you care about ahead of Christmas on Friday. To enter all you have to do is guess our mystery voice this morning and WhatsApp your name and the answer to 087 9180 180. So who's this? He's a physical monster. He does all his work every single day. He's a handful in and around the box as well. Okay, if you don't have it by now, you probably won't be able to guess it. But here's your last chance to hear the voice. He's a physical monster. He does all his work every single day. He's a handful in and around the box as well. All right, we'll be doing the draw in about 10 minutes' time for that one and we'll announce the winner then. Now, uh, delighted to say we're joined by both Sean Reedy and Graeme O'Toole because later today on OTB Sports Radio at 2 pm, the split season is going to air. It's a new GEA documentary series available as well, of course, on our OTB podcast network over the Christmas. It's going to be airing the episodes four in all across the Christmas break. We've got episodes coming as well on Christmas Eve, Monday the 28th. Tuesday 29th and Wednesday the 30th. Sean and Graham, good morning to you lads. Good morning, Will. Hello, Will, how are you? Look, I don't know which one of you wants to start off on this, but tell me where the idea for this documentary came because we have had this extremely unusual year that's gone by. And was that a case that you wanted to just document it, lads? Uh, I think what happened was, Will, is around the time that the level five restrictions were due to come into place and there was that whole conversation and I like it kind of struck a bit home for me because my parents own a small business and around the time that there was the conversation of should the county, the inter-county season go ahead, uh, my own dad was forced to close his business. And to be honest with you, even though I come from a GAA background, come from a huge GAA family, it's probably where I spent most of my life growing up was the local GAA club. I was probably one of the people that were a little bit cynical, a little bit angry, thought that it probably shouldn't have gone ahead. And uh, one day I sent a, 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 an extremely long WhatsApp voice note to Graham saying that if it's going ahead, there should be some sort of documentation of it. To be honest with you, Will, I think when the idea of the documentary came about is I think we thought that the, the season, would, you know, might not go ahead or something would happen in the middle that, you know, would have to get called off. And I just thought there's a story there to be told and it's probably uh, an interesting one to be a part of. Now, ultimately, it, it ran off smoothly, but... You know, you saw everything that happened in the middle of it with COVID cases and Waterford and Tyrone and, and you know, all the issues with the LGFA over the last couple of weeks. Like, there, there's, as every year, there's a story there to be told, but this year was probably just a little bit more mad than previous years. Yeah, because, Sean, that's the kind of unusual part. You're documenting this. Usually when someone decides to cover a story, they have a fair idea about where it's going to go. But even right yeah. into the middle of this championship, we were wondering, was it ever going to be completed? Which I'd imagine is a challenge itself when you're trying to follow along the story here. Yeah, so it, it's really it's really weird. Like, uh, Graham had the task of actually uh, editing it all and putting it together. So when we used to sit down and record with each of the players every week, I think we kind of, there was a period of time where we didn't really know where it was going because you're, you're, you're just, like, like it is that really interesting thing. Like you're trying to get the, the championship buzz and the, the same kind of, you, you want to get the championship cliches, I suppose, out of the players, but they're just not there. Like, you know, some of the players were very vocal and honest about, especially at the start, that even if they were happy to play the championship, they probably weren't getting the same kind of buzz that they would have. Um, I know, like one of the participants in the documentary is Connor McDonald, and and he says, you know, their their uh, opener against Galway in Croke Park first round of Leinster Championship, you'd be thinking playing Galway way in Croke Park that it would be a huge occasion and he just said the whole occasion kind of fell flat for him so you know I think that that is a story in itself that these elite athletes were, were kind of their, their games were a bit falling at the wayside for them. Graham can I just ask you as well on that um, uh, you know this being an amateur sport uh, but players had to adapt to, to, to everyday new things the masks the tests uh, all to be expected from professional athletes you would think but how impressed were you by by these athletes that you spoke to over the, the course of making the documentary, especially given the fact that they're dealing with these circumstances uh, as amateur athletes? Yeah, Shane, I think that was one of the main reasons we kind of embarked on the documentary was because these amateur athletes were given elite status. So if you were listening to, I remember when Leo Varadkar was on Mac Cooper, near the end when level five was kind of muted about coming in and he was asked, 
will the championship go ahead in level five? And Leo Varadkar said no at the time because they're not like the provincial rugby teams or the Premier League where they can be tested constantly, they can live in a bubble. They have to go out, back into the community. They have to live with their families. They have to go work with other people as well. They have to travel around the country when the whole place is in lockdown. So we are extremely, extremely impressed with how they adapted to it as well. And it's interesting when you were chatting to all the different players and how all the different counties had their own little ways of doing things as well. And we had Ronan McNamee from Tyrone on it as well. And he was just discussing how difficult they found it in doing video analysis. Because obviously, usually they would gather in a sports hall and do video analysis about the team they're about to play. But then he talked about the difficulty in actually sitting down and having the host in good Wi-Fi. And they tried to do it for the league game against Mayo, which was the game before the Donegal, the first round of the Ulster Championship. And they said they just had to scrap it as well. So it was very interesting just to see how all the teams had their own little ways of doing things. But really, really impressive how an amateur setup kind of adapted into such an elite mentality. And Graham, were you, were you aware or did you feel the, the almost the weight of history on your shoulders making this in that it's such a unique and iconic year uh, for all the wrong reasons? But the fact is, we will look back on this GA championship season as one of the most extraordinary in our, in our history. There's a reading in the years kind of vibe off of all, all yeah. of this. So like, were you fully aware of that weight of history when you were making it? Yeah, like we, because that's what we said at the beginning. We were like, somebody has to document this. And I think it was Kira Martin. We've got Kira Martin, the Westmead captain, as well, when we were talking about him, uh, would he do it? And he was saying that he was actually talking to his parents as well, saying he's surprised nobody's come to him before this because it's such a momentous year. So that when we actually did approach him, he was jumping at the opportunity. So we were very, and we're very conscious as well that these are their stories as well, because this isn't just about the football teams and the tactics and the results. This is about the people and how their lives have been shaped as well. Because some people had their own businesses. Con McDonald, as Sean mentioned, he owns his own gym in Wexford in Gorey. And he obviously struggled this year because like he, his gym was closed down for the majority of the year. So it wasn't just the weight of the story of the championship. It was their stories of 2020 as well. It was their personal life. So I think we were very conscious of that as well while doing the documentary. All right, we've got a chance to uh, hear from some of the players that the lads have been chatting to as well. Let's first of all hear from Dublin All-Ireland winner Neve Collins, who spoke about the scheduling scandal that happened just a couple of weeks ago around the LGFA and the All-Ireland semi-finals. Over the last couple of years, the leading story with women's GAA sports has, you know, sometimes been a negative headline or something that was not to do with the game that was playing. I feel like a lot of the time you know, we're focused on, you know, welfare issues rather than actually being able to talk about, you know, styles of play or matchup yeah. or some really exciting elements of women's sport that people haven't gotten to know about yet because they're not being covered because we're still talking about player welfare issues. So it's really frustrating and it's really disappointing. And I feel awful for Galway and for Cork because their, you know, moment on the stage has been overshadowed by what is a really, really disappointing player welfare issue. Graham, interesting, um, obviously, that you were able to bring this topic into it too. And I think there's a very fair point made by Neve there, which is that we're all guilty of it, that the story on the back of that Galway against Cork game wasn't about what happened on the field, but the discussion for the next 48 hours or so were entirely about what happened with the game being switched to Parnell Park and Crow Park. And you can really hear the frustration from Neve there, even though she wasn't directly affected by the fixture itself. Yeah, myself and Sean actually had a conversation before we chatted to Neve after that semi-final because we didn't want to make the conversation with Neve all about that game. We wanted to focus on Dublin's victory and their lead up to the final. So when we were asking her the question about it, we said, we completely understand if you do want to answer this question, if you want to concentrate on your own team. But the way Neve reacted, we thought was fantastic. She said, no, this actually didn't just affect Cork and Galway. This affected the LGFA as a whole. And I think the whole kind of organization really came together in how they were treated that weekend. So it wasn't just the two teams, everyone was affected. And it just was a sign of how they're all in it together. All right, we can hear about the different situation in Ulster now because Tyrone's Rona McNamee also part of the documentaries with the guys, one of the featured players. And they asked him, was it different playing football in the north of Ireland with the way that the COVID restrictions were being handled there? 
not not that I thought of it that would be left out of the championship. Would burn every town in Ireland if it came to it. Start a absolute handling because we we're obviously going on Boris Johnson making decisions. Um, and he doesn't. I, I would imagine he's not the biggest Gaelic fan, to be honest. I would say the same boy wouldn't have a clue if Thrones in the championship or not. We're listening to clowns across the water to an extent, and then finger pointing in Belfast. So, what can you do, boys? Yeah, that was fascinating stuff there from uh, Ronan McNamee, the Throne footballer, on this uh, new documentary, Split Season. Sean, can I ask you, from speaking to all of these players, was there any semblance of reluctance on players' behalf to return? I'm sure attitudes changed across the championship when people realised that the merits of, of having games to look forward to, even for, for supporters. But did you kind of sense any reluctance on players' behalf to return? Yeah, um, now you have to listen to the documentary, Shane, to find out how they actually <laughs> felt about it. But there was, it was a very split um, amongst the players. You, you'll, you'll not be surprised. Those who went far, including Niamh and Declan, who ultimately went on to win the All-Ireland, they were obviously quite happy to see it go ahead. But not without their own reservations, like Declan Hannan tells a few really interesting stories um, about, you know, because we did try to get their retrospective experience on lockdown and their club championship experience. And Declan Hannan actually had a very harrowing experience where a neighbour of his was in ICU for 60 days with the virus and sadly passed away and they couldn't go to the future funeral um so and then Connor McDonald who Graham mentioned had a local business and he was kind of and he lives with his parents and he was saying well if it ultimately comes down to working and looking after my parents versus playing this you know I I really have to sit down and have a serious conversation I, I think like at the start all of them were probably a little bit hesitant I think all of them wanted to play for their love of hurling love of football or just you know you know, wanted to get out there and not be stuck at home and not do a repeat of the first lockdown and watching reruns of old games. But, you know, there there was a lot of hesitancy. And actually, originally we had a different, we had a few extras in the lineup to this, but, you know, just for various reasons, some couldn't um, commit to doing it. And some of them were really opposed to it. And uh, it, it was just something that I found kind of a bit, I don't want to say they were forced to do it, but some of them were left in the situation where they really wanted to play this game, but they had such other you know, stuff to think about in a wider society, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, Sean mentioned uh, Declan Hannan, the Limerick hurling captain who lifted the Lee McCarthy just a few weeks ago. This is what Declan had to say. I think it does. Yeah, I think it does. We were training last night and there was a great buzz around the place. It's, you know, seven, seven, eight days out from an All-Ireland final, which is fantastic. I suppose the only difference, obviously, is, you know, around Limerick City there, there's just all the Christmas lights are up and a couple of Limerick flags around the place as well. So in that sense, it's totally different and, you know, you're not going to meet anyone, so the, the hype and everything like that will be different to 2018, but Jesus, uh, we, as players anyway, we can't wait for it. It's, it's an all the final. This is what you want, this is the, day, the days you want to be playing, so like we're going to go hell for a letter for it. There you go, Declan Hannan. I'll tell you what, Graham, that's great access to get to get an All-Ireland captain seven days out from a final speaking to you. Yeah, we were, we were actually so lucky when when we think about it, we were just talking about myself and Sean as we were finishing it and how lucky we were because as Sean said, we did have a few other players that had agreed to it and we had more in the bank, but due to some reasons, they had to pull out. But when we had five players and two of them ended up actually winning the championship in such a historic year, it was it was brilliant. And especially with that Limerick team, it looked like they're really going to push on as well. So to have Declan as part of this documentary, we're really, really proud. It makes us look like, you know, we tactically picked two <laughs> players that we knew were going to win. I'm not a betting man, Will, but... <laughs> you hedge your bets nicely, lads. The four episodes uh, of the split season will air on Off the Ball over Christmas on News Talk. Tune in to OTB Sports Radio at 2 o'clock this afternoon uh, to get a bit of a feel of what's coming up with the lads over the next while. Graham and Sean, thanks a million for joining us on the show this morning. Thanks, Will. Thank thanks, you, Shane. Will. Thanks, Shane. All right, well, let's tell you about our mystery voice winner. Uh, with thanks to One for All, we had a 100 euro gift voucher up for grabs. All you had to do was identify our mystery voice on this morning's show. He's a physical monster. He does all his work every single day. He's a handful in and around the box as well. 
of course, that was Ole Gunnar Solskjaer, the Manchester United boss, who was speaking about Scott McTominay after United's win against Leeds at the weekend. Our congratulations to Dermot Byrne in Limerick, who has come out of the draw. We'll be in touch about your prize. The one-for-all gift card from your local post offices. The perfect last-minute gifting option for family, friends and colleagues this Christmas. They will be available for purchase from post offices nationwide up until closing time, which is 1 p.m. on Christmas Eve. We'll be giving you another chance to win tomorrow morning ahead of uh, those one-for-all gift vouchers finishing at 1 o'clock on Thursday. That's it from all of us here on OTBM for this morning, brought to you every morning with Gillette. Good mornings start with Gillette, giving you the confidence to tackle the morning ahead. Uh, coming up tomorrow morning, we are going to be joined uh, by a couple of hurling greats and Tommy Welch and Garrod Hegarty. They'll be with Ger and Nathan. Right now, here's a chance to hear two of the Dublin stars uh, from their six-in-a-row success who were on Off the Ball with Joe last night in it's Johnny Cooper and Kevin McMenamin. Now we are turning to reflect on Dublin 214, Mayo 15 points. Very happy to say, and we appreciate them making time for us. We have Johnny Cooper back on the show, All Ireland number seven. Johnny, congrats. How you doing? Good. Yeah, thank you. All's good. You're the per relation here because All Ireland number eight, Kevin McManaman. You're very welcome as well. How you doing? You joined an exclusive list. Congrats. Thanks very much, bud. Appreciate it. So what have you two been up to since you won? I mean, a, a team hanging out on, on uh, Saturday, Johnny? Was it a case of go to a quiet function room together? Or do you hook up kind of yesterday and hang out? What's, what's been the last few days? Yeah, we just try to enjoy each other's company. Obviously, it's a little bit different this year. There wasn't a, a function as such or a, an after party. Uh, but nonetheless, we try to share a bit of each other's company. Uh, we're just talking there to Kev. We, we haven't crossed paths ourselves that much. Um, the last day or so so the nature of these things is it pulls you left right and center so or left and right i should say so uh, yeah no it's been good it's so good. Wh where, where have you been dragged then so I, I thought you might all stick together as a tight group now at this day you're off in what side sessions happening here and there is it <laughs> uh splinter groups going on yeah <laughs> uh, i know we've been with each other to be fair but uh in each other's company but yeah we haven't crossed paths too much that's the nature of it though where have you been kevin how have you spent it yeah, I, I met uh, Michael Darry yesterday actually and watched, had a look at the ladies' game uh, down in Hooks. And then I was in various uh, spots in around the city centre <laughs> for the evening. But uh, trying to get my head back, I had to do a small a small bit of work this morning, um, which I thought I'd get away with not doing, but I had to get it done. So I had to be fairly respectable myself, so I'm fairly sane today. I'm not, not hugging me knees like I have been in previous years. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a, a blessing there somewhere. So, I mean, I saw, we, we, we had a problem with the video, but we were, we were going to embarrass you by starting with the Damien Dempsey video, which is leaked out. I know you guys probably hate that when the sanctity of the dressing room is broken. So I saw you front and centre anyway, Kevin. I don't know, was Johnny singing? Are you a singer, Johnny? No, 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 definitely okay. not. Your, your, your next room, staying away from that malarkey. Yeah, definitely, yeah. That uh, was a crack, though. It does look, Kevin, like a special thing to do. You know, uh, it's it's not you know not too many circumstances where you'd have uh, it looked like maybe 15, 20 Irish lads, stone cold sober, uh, singing in you know broad daylight, looking into each other's eyes. It's kind of a special time. Yeah. One particular man wearing very very little clothes as well, <laughs> which I did notice. I wasn't too it. Um, yeah, look, it, it is it is a great spot, and we were probably there for twenty minutes, half an hour, and I think we'd Philly Marcus DJ and we'd different different uh, different tunes and all it is nice it's it, it's always something that um i i've loved and traditionally um you know uh, when we've won titles there's crowds there and you're seeing friends from clubs and you're giving hugs to family members and you're running over to hill 16 and stuff and that wasn't obviously a runner this year so it was just yeah look a nice a nice touch and we're all big um we're all big game with mc fans in the in in, in the group we we often meet up at the at his gigs in Baker Street over Christmas, and we sing that tune at uh, top of our lungs. So maybe it was yeah, just for the dressing room this year. But mm. um, all going well, we'll be back now in 2021 in in Baker Street, but uh, singing our hearts out the Church of Damo. Mm. I presume he's been into you a few times, has he, Kevin? Uh we we run across uh, yeah, come across his path the odd time um, over 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 the years. Um, he's a, he's a, he's an amazing man. I've been blessed to get to know him over the years, and he's he's just a wonderful man. And uh, yeah, he 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 nearly embodies what Dublin is about a lot of the time, and speaks for a lot of people who don't have who don't have the voice, you know. And he's um, 
yeah, become friends with a few of the guys in the team and um he's been out of one or two of the after parties over the years and we've a great we've a great bond with him actually, you know, and his music is part of um part of the city and part of what, what we do in our team um consistently. So yeah, he's um he's a lovely man as well, yeah. He's a great guy. Johnny, All Ireland number seven then, it must feel different each time. Compare the feeling and I know look, these are particularly strange circumstances when you don't have Hill sixteen uh, there, but even leaving that aside for a moment, the feelings that come with winning number six or number seven versus number one or number two, can you compare what it means to you or how it sits with you in those moments afterwards? Um, yeah, I haven't really thought about it, to be honest, uh, in that way, but yeah, different. I think, as Kev said there, this was kind of unique and that it was just the well, 40 odd or 50 odd of us kind of together, albeit you'd obviously love your family and supporters there, but. This one was uh, particularly tight um, with, with ourselves. I mean, um, I always remember actually calling Kev. I think it was back in 2013, coming into the final, and I couldn't get out of my head. Uh, in my head, winning that that particular game, and said, like, "Kev, I just need a bit of a distraction to keep me focused." Um, and then I guess, yeah, as a transition through the over the years, then it's yeah, I don't know, it's just different. I don't know how to maybe put it into words. To be honest, um, mm -hmm. they're all unique. It looks from afar, maybe Kev, you could come in, it looks like almost a deeper sense of satisfaction as opposed to immediate ecstasy, maybe. I think so. And look, look, there was a big big release last year and a big change with Desi coming in. And I think um, look, we wanted to treat this year for what it is. You know, it's not a traditional year. It's not a traditional Sunni Crow Park. And I think the effort that our management has put in this year was, and I, that's one of the things that I was delighted to see rewarded because um, a really challenging year for those guys. And um, we, we genuinely said one in a row and there was no, probably the five became a bit of a, a bit of a weight on us last year at times. And I think this year it was just that, let's just try and, you know, win, win the one in front of us and um, to see how, how the, the satisfaction on, on the likes of Desi and Mick Galvin and, Shane O'Hanlon, I was chatting to him yesterday, a great chat with him and the work that they put in and Darren Daly and, and Brian O'Regan that they and, and all the backroom staff, I think there was there was this there was a, a little different feel for them, I think being their first year involved. So mm. um that was one thing that stood out for me and uh, yeah, yeah. I noticed you at full time and I was, I was trying to think, is, is is he always a crier? I don't know if you are, but I thought you looked emotional, Kevin, at full time. I thought there were tears in the eyes. There were, yeah, yeah. And we always acquire. I find that I, I am a lot. Of, I, 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 I do partake in a few tears the odd time. Yeah, my, I'm an emotional man. I'm an emotional being. And what is it? Yeah, that, what, what, what is it that sets you off? Is it thinking of family, or is it a certain person in the squad? What is it that kind of is the, uh, is the, the, the straw that breaks the camel's back when it comes to tears? Um, I, it's, it's trying not to hold it back too much. I, I guess, I guess. I just loved. I love the group. Um, I, I I love my some of my best friends are in the group. I love winning, and even though I wasn't on the pitch, um, it's it's a massive part of my life. It's a massive part of my identity, and to 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 see the likes of, uh, like you know, Sean Bugler, Paddy Small, these guys having their first title, Desi the same. Um, so it's, that's really important for me, and the other thing probably look my look. It's been a tough year for a lot of people. My my. Family, like we're at home. It's my first, probably the first match or big match that my mom and dad haven't been to in years. Mm. We we lost my lost my uncle recently to COVID, and um, there was a bit of that, and you know, probably thinking about my, my my family, how much they would love to be there, and and how maybe a bit of a lift it might give them. Um, so there was a bit of that going on as well. There's because yeah. I'm look, I'm not, I'm sure I'm not the only person um, who's who's experienced that over the last while, and so there was a defo defo. Um, yeah, a bit of a bit of love for my my family going on there as well, you know. Ah, yeah, I'm sure. Look, it's it, that's horrific, you know. I mean, I haven't lost anyone uh, with COVID, thankfully, and and most people haven't. But it it must be really hard to take and digest. And you know, I don't know, is it your mum's side or your dad's side? But that's obviously on your mind in a big way. Yeah, a little bit. And it was I was trying to use you know think about it in a different way in the in the lead up to the game. Um, but oh, look, it's, it's my dad's brother, um, Uncle Pat. But he's been—he he was an absolutely amazing man, and you know, just a shame maybe we couldn't we couldn't honour him in the way that he might have deserved or liked. Um, and he definitely had more 
he had more years in the tank. But um, right. look, that's that, that's that's part of what we're experiencing right now, and hopefully it's all it's all turning, and we'll see hear those stories less and less. But um, yeah, yeah for so that was that was definitely um, in 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 my mind at the at the full time whistle. And it's interesting, you know, because I'm I'm conscious you know your stuff when it comes to sports psychology it's interesting you said there you maybe thought of using it in a slightly different way in advance of the final because i would again being more on the outside and, and picking up snippets almost hear a lot of sports people or psychologists talking about taking emotion out and not you know using stuff like that necessarily stick to the process i guess is the the great cliche in what way did you allow yourself use it um I, I look. I, sport is an emo, it's an emotional game, and I think if we were, um, yeah, if we were logical all the time, we wouldn't. I don't think Johnny would be as successful as he is if he was the, a, a logical being on the pitch all the time. So you have to balance the two, the head and the heart. And how, how do I do it? I suppose you're just keeping them in your thoughts. You're um, not necessary. I think when you go out onto the pitch, there is a. Uh, I have a job to do. Look, I didn't even get on the I didn't even get on the pitch, yeah. <laughs> so I didn't get a chance maybe to express myself the way the way I like to. But ah, uh, look, I guess I guess I'm, I I I settled in and and wrote a bit down about maybe what it means to represent who I'm representing um, when I go out there and stuff like that. So um, maybe that's that's an answer to mm. to your question. Maybe how it how is, I yeah. might have used that. Um, no, it is for sure. It is for sure. Jeez, I mean, look, when you've got, <laughs> when you're on that bench and you're looking at Howard and Mannion, it's getting harder and harder to get off that bench. My God. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> very true. And look, credit credit goes out to to, to the lads and Polly and Philly, Philly, Mark and Cormac Costco. Every one of them brought brought an edge to the game and and and, and raised it a little bit. And and I I can see Howard's name everywhere, but it wasn't he wasn't the, he wasn't the Lone Ranger sure. either. And um. I think in the second half we kind of grew into it. That kind of three four minute period after the the second water break, Howard got a lovely boomer, Mannion a lovely free from mm. winning from a kick out, and then I think Dean got a free a minute later from Kieran Kenny. And I think that was a two point. It was a two point game to a five point game, and I think that was probably the winning of the game for us. Yeah, it was. It was amazing. I don't know, I mean, Johnny, your perspective on it, but. You you have a look back at the game, and it, unlike the twelve minutes in the semi final post se, post uh, half time last year, there was a kind of a subtlety about the way uh, Dublin closed this game out. As as Kevin says, I think Niall Scully won a free. Dean Rock knocks that over easily. Kilkenny scores a nice easy point by his standards. Mannion scores that great point. Howard scores a great point, and then there's another nothing free. And suddenly, with ten minutes to go, you're up by five, and that's not a position you guys tend to give up that often. So. Uh, it was almost a less dramatic flash way of winning it, but I don't know. Could you could you get a sense on the field post half time that you were starting to come into the ascendancy, or what was your feeling out there? Yeah, well, I guess there's so many different uh, skill sets that any one individual can bring to the game. So whether it's somebody kicking an outside reboot or Scully and doing all the work to do off the ball, like so many different sides of people's games that if they do and obviously teams will lock down a couple of your your players bigger players at different times and just to, just to share the load I guess um, yeah there probably was if you have got a handle the first I think the first few minutes of the second half in particular we were down a man uh, managed to take a little bit of control out, or take a little bit of control um, around the game and that was important I think maybe and then when we got 15 back we were able to maybe go to a few more moves as such that we would like to try and get to and, and as you said that someone paid off and the people the finishers that came on as well as Kev said too well actually so you mentioned that post half time the, the two throw-ins second half you keep the ball for I think the guts of two minutes off the throw-in that's no mistake I suspect that with, with 14 men and then um, geez I mean if uh, Jim Gavin admitted last year the merchant play was uh, you know relatively pre-planned I presume something similar with the goal after 15 seconds, the, that space doesn't empty up right through the centre of the pitch, Johnny, without you lads coordinating something. No, definitely. There's obviously a lot of smarts. Um, it was a powerful run. James does that all the time, to be fair to him. Um, and just a bit like Owen's goal last year, things just opened up a little bit. And then you had um, Dean, Dean in the right position. Who, yeah, so again, just the smarts of the, lot, the guys pulling out away. Um, haven't watched it back now, to be honest, only from my recall from the game but um yeah no no it's 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 yeah as I said people can we can go to different strands if we need to we can run we can kick we can uh, slow it down if we need depending on the tempo of the game so look that's just I guess a bit of the experience that's there too who were you marking for the bulk of your time out there Johnny was it O'Shea for most of it um Ryan O'Donnell in the first half 
for, for, for a lot of it and then ended up on Aiden O'Shea for a good few of the ball. It's just the way it works out. It's not probably the way in which we would like to have some of the matchups, but look, that's just the nature of the those games sometimes. And would you have prepared during the week knowing you were marking O'Donoghue or who did you have in mind when you were preparing? Um, yeah, no, I'd probably keep it um, quite wide in terms of my own personal preparation. I probably have four or five on my list in terms of the the preparation and the analysis that you do, um, the key points around them. So I would never probably just isolate or go to one or, or two right. for that matter. Um, yeah, probably four or five on my list. Okay. Um, you spoke brilliantly last year about geez, the, the roller coaster of emotions post uh, sending off in the drawn final. And I think Jack McCaffrey saying to you, don't worry, bud, we got you. And then uh, a reprieve and then the ecstasy, I suppose, of putting it all right. When you have that tussle with O'Shea and he goes to ground and you turn around and look at David Coldrick, are you fearful of a black card or what's your sense of what's just happened? No, no, it didn't even enter my head. Uh, people were slagging me after, lads were slagging me after that it was, but uh, in, in the game, I didn't feel that at all. Um, right. But uh, yeah, when you look back, I haven't looked at, back at it, so maybe it was, I looked closer, but didn't feel like that in the game. Anyway. I would have been, I think he could have stayed up, but I, th I, I think on balance, I might have flashed a red black card in your direction. I don't know, Kevin, I'm, do I have that wrong? Um, I don't know. I think, I think, um, yeah. It must, he, I didn't know Johnny was that strong. Aiden fall, fall, falling over when he got walloped by him. But um, I know I'm only buzzing. I'm only buzzing. Uh, I don't know. I think I think look. I think black cards have actually probably relatively disappeared out of the game this year. I don't think people are because of the ten minutes. I haven't seen much of them. It feels like they're kind of they're not being given as much. Um, I which I think is probably a good thing. I think I think if if someone is, is cynically slowing down the game or you know getting someone's way and you know, obviously doing it, and look, obviously it was happening a lot. Uh, you know, maybe ten years ago it was happening a lot, which is why the rule was brought in. But it's probably good to see that mm. there's, there's less and less black cards. Um, it seems, anyway, to me, in the last, or this, this in this championship, you know. Yeah, well, to be fair, Kevin, but they're kind of non-existent at club level. Are they right? Like, well, like, I, from my like my feeling that you just don't see them as much. I think referees are just rather giving the yellow cards and unless it's blatant, you know, or unless they're mm. deliberately trying to finish off a game or whatever it is, you know. Well, maybe that's the way it should be, really. And to be fair, Kevin McStay on the TV said it was probably 50-50 and just two lads going at it and not a black card. I'm being harsh on you here, Johnny, so ignore me. Um, how did you find it out there? Because Mayo brings something that, you know, they, they suck you into a game at times. And, like, the stat which jumped out at me, Johnny, I don't know, did, did you get this at half time? But in the first half, which was amazing, 22 first half kickouts. Mayo won all of their own 12. And then of Dublin's 10 in the first half, Mayo won five. And it's funny, I know you probably don't pay any attention to pre-match talk in the media, but the kickouts was an area where a lot of the pundits were saying, geez, Dublin could really dominate and they've got Fenton and lots of great lads and, you know, Mayo could find that sticky. And actually, Mayo really did an, a bit of a number on you guys kick-out-wise in the first half. So that was one area where they caused trouble. What else did you feel out there was, was, was proven tricky or what were what were you kind of struggling to uh, cope with in so much as you can cope uh, with the game that you ultimately won. But but give us a sense out there, if you can, of, of what areas you felt, geez, that's a fire we need to put out, that's something else that's causing us stress out here. Um, it was probably a little bit more of our own execution, to be honest, and right. look, that's probably to Mayo's credit in terms of the intensity and the way in which they present themselves. You mentioned kickouts. It's a massive part of the game. I didn't know that stat, but I'm probably not surprised either. So I guess you feel that level of intensity. They're pretty close to you at all times. And then if they're winning and they're coming at you in ways, we, we obviously know they're running threat, um, particularly from their, their full back line right out. So um, they, they caught us with a few there. But I think maybe some of our execution, um, you know, be it around the kickouts or be it coming out of defence, we probably just couldn't maybe get a bit of a flow to our game, but as I said, it's probably great credit to, to Mayo and the intensity that they bring to. Mm. What was your perspective on it, Kevin, watching on? You know what, like, it's funny, I, I, someone said yesterday that we, we played brutally, and I was kind of going, Jesus, I just, I thought we played it exceptionally, like, and considering the, the challenge that Mayo bring, one of the things that I, I did find interesting, they, they thought they did it really well, is they actually forced us back, and under new rules, we can't go back to the keeper, but... I'd say of those we won, I'd say maybe four of them went back to Stephen in the in the first half, and then they set up something that I haven't seen them do a huge amount, where they essentially put ten bodies in between the forty-five and the sixty-five, and we just couldn't cross the halfway line too easily, you know, without having to go back across and really slow the game down. So something like that, I thought that was, um, and it one of the real interesting parts of the game, particularly in the first half, and I think when. 
when they had they had to come at us a little bit after Robbie came back on in the second half, we were able to find little gaps in behind and uh, attack the wings a little bit more. So mm. um, it was something that it was something that impressed me, and I think it it it, it definitely slowed us down a lot. And um, the 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 pace at which they tackled our team was something that we probably haven't experienced yet this year. Mm. Um, and look, yeah, no, and luckily the lads were the lads were were a match for them in many ways, you know. Yeah, they're always great games to watch. Um, that was an interesting point you said, Kev, about maybe the five in a row being a bit of a weight, which is not surprising given everything it represents. And Jack McCaffrey was talking here relatively recently to Bernard Brogan on the podcast, and he remembers after the drawn game just thinking, oh, man, I'm empty, you know, and almost needing to step mm -hmm. away. Um, can you relate to that, Kevin? Do you, did you get a sense others in the group, especially uh, last year, were feeling the the weight of it, you know? I mean, nobody else has stepped away, but I, I, I can't think Jack McCaffrey was the only person as demanding as his job might be, thinking, oh, the demands of this now are starting to really become tricky. Um, like, I suppose it's two questions. Was it was the demands of the game too, too much last year, or was it the idea that the whole country was, half the country, or all Dublin were looking for us to win it, and, and maybe the rest of us, the country, <laughs> were looking for us to lose it? Uh, I guess I just I guess there was maybe a bit of tension in in how we played, and I just thinking into that game, like I think I think we'd five misses in our last six shots or something like that. So maybe I think that that, that is kind of a product of us just worrying about like we constantly knew it was at the door, but mm. the doorbell was just kept ringing, ringing, ringing all year. And um, well, we dealt with it fairly well. I just thought it was a little bit. Um, yeah, it was just a little bit of a, pre of a of a bigger pressure than usual, and I just I just didn't feel it as much this year. Now I remember the drawing game last year. I was supposed to be in Croatia on the Wednesday, and I had a lovely holiday planned. <laughs> um, and so Sorry, I was getting pressure from elsewhere <laughs> about why I couldn't go over on my holidays. But um, uh, anyway, we we eventually uh, look. We, we we got the job done two weeks later, and that's the nature of the game, you know. Yeah, how are you finding things, Johnny? Are you as 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 hungry as ever, as motivated as ever, as the tank feel as full as ever? Uh, yeah, yeah. Obviously, there's not a big wait to, for next year's season, so or in the campaign, so we'll take stock. We'll obviously enjoy the Christmas um, and all that, and we'll take stock and see where we go. But yeah, there's still personally massive uh, capacity I would feel in me, and lots of growth to be to be made. Um, so. Look forward to getting on that journey, hopefully, and uh, look, we'll talk to Desi and see what mm. what happens there. What was the biggest difference, Johnny, between Desi and Jim? Um, this has been asked a good few times, and obviously people are very curious uh, to know what's the... I, I don't know, like, the different way of doing things, I guess, and nor should they be the same, but... Um, the, yeah, Desi's so passionate and caring, um, and he brings a lot of that... Not that Jim didn't, but um, he brings a lot of that, I guess. And the lads, he would have worked with lots of them lads growing up. And I think Kieran was saying they had him as development squad under 13 or under 14s right up. So right. Yeah, he has obviously a um, particular connection and bond uh, with a few more of the group than Jim would have had when he came in first. Yeah, Kevin, what strikes you about Desi's approach? Um, yeah, v very, very, very driven. Very driven character. And... Um, very yeah, like Johnny said, passionate just about about Dublin football, and I, I wasn't aware that he had put so much effort in with the with the young guys. And I think uh, it's it's only when it, you see the you know the love the love that lads have for him and Mick and the lads like um, but he yeah definitely definitely a different a, a different approach than um, than Jim. You know, Jim probably had that uh, uh, structured army kind of background, and I suppose it just shows that that two two. Um, Two completely different characters with two different approaches can can get the job done. There's no one way to manage, you know. Mm. And uh, assuming Desi wants you back involved, Kevin, when will you make up your mind about going back in again? Uh, I'll, I'll, new, new year, I think that's for me. I would probably, have, yeah, yeah, New Year. I'm interested to see the season. I, I kind of, um, I know there's been a bit of him and on about mm. what way the season is going. I don't know if that's been confirmed, but. Um, that will be, yeah, a discussion with uh, with Desi and have a little think and chat to the people in the inner the inner circle and we'll, we'll, we'll look at it in, in, in the new year. Yeah, well, it's looking like you'd be wrapped up by July if it did go again. That seems to be the way it's going to go and straight into National League in February. I mean, allowing the world not going um, 
crazy as well. Kevin, can I ask you this? As some, you know, been, you've been around a long time. You've seen the good and the bad of Dublin. Uh, the Dublin dominance debate is alive and well. And I do have. I don't want to get too into it. Not least in uh, on the back of the weekend you've just had. But mm. there's obviously you know a, a bunch of players in your team, understandably, who are saying, well, like, all the money in the world doesn't make it easier for me to get up at 7 a.m. and do a gym session or prehab or practice uh, my skill set. And yet, you know, the advantages of population in particular, I think, going forward, and, and then obviously finances in terms of bringing on younger players, uh, do give Dublin a huge advantage. Are you, <laughs> see, I was going to use the word worried, so as a dub, you're not going to be worried. But can you, do you have a sense, like, are, are we staring down, you know, a future now where Dublin have harnessed all the advantages they have brilliantly, like, and, and, and this thing could be 31 counties versus Dublin, and, and Dublin always winning, I don't know, five, six, seven, a decade. Do you, can you see how it might go that way? Do you have a concern it might go that way? Do you think that's okay for GAA? Um, it's a very doom and gloom approach, <laughs> I think. Welcome to the media. Um, yeah, like, and you know, I, I guess, like, what I always think about this one is, is like, like who, like, uh, this will sound wrong, like, whose problem, like, who, who's the, whose job is it to solve this, you know? Mm. Because it's not mine and Johnny's, like, you no, know. No, it's not. I feel like, I feel like, I wonder, because I, I always hear that, you know, people like players and, you know, managers, they're, like, all getting asked about it, and I kind of think, well, who actually, who? And I'd love to know what you think. Whose job is it to solve it, you know, because... I'd go on, yeah. I was going to say, I, I suppose you could argue GEA centrally, but I was also going to say, I haven't heard a great solution yet. Uh, you know, divvy up the money better, for sure. Dublin will always probably have financial advantages. I mean, I think if we're, if we're into the realm of splitting Dublin in two and throwing out hundred and however many years of tradition, Oh, like, I really just can't come to that. And amalgamating other counties is just as kind of an awful a thought for those counties. So, uh, genuinely, Kevin, I haven't heard uh, a solution. I've heard lots of complaining about it, and I've heard lots of diagnosing the problem. And there is a, for want of a different word or whatever, there is a problem or an issue there. But I don't see an easy solution, to be honest. That's why it's it's so tricky, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah, and I don't think I'm the person to come up, to, to come <laughs> up with the meter, but... Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I, I think it's just because cause the other thing is to be careful of is is there, there does seem to be a bit of an exaggeration and uh, of the what's what's happening. Like there's 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 a bit of embellishment there as well. So uh, I think it needs a bit more a bit to be a bit more kind of you know fact based and stuff because it's it it would get to a stage where and like you can see people maybe like a twenty. The people that like there's a lot of players that have played against our team mm. um and i in fairness like a lot of people that we would have gone to war with and they're going you know lads you don't you don't get it these are a good team and these are doing things the right way and they have their house in order um but you know and then so and, and that's nice to hear because it'd be easy to say ah they only beat us because of x one and dead but, yeah um yeah and i think yeah you're dead right uh, the solution hasn't been um brought forward and I'm not yeah willing to give my you know and I, I don't probably have one either. No, know? I appreciate that. I appreciate well, that. I guess I guess it's like who is the person because it's not it's definitely not me, you know. Yeah. Um, and look, it's probably not the right thing to bring up. To be fair, on the on the uh, Monday afterwards, Johnny, we'll finish on a on a better note. Can you sum up then this uh, strange championship from a Dublin perspective and how it's been for you and what it's meant to you? Another All Ireland. It's an amazing achievement. Yeah, no, sure. I think something that jumps to mind <clears throat> for me is just the respect and the amount of respect that, that I uh, have for for Kev and, and all the teammates. Just to see the things that went on in the background and people going through difficult journeys and challenges and, and whatnot. So, you know, it doesn't surprise me, definitely, but uh, just a massive uh, respect for me. Um, and obviously, you couldn't share there with our families and friends and supporters, but that's probably the second thing for me is just uh, hopefully that in, their, in our own little way there were smiles around Dublin households um, while people were enjoying each other's companies given the, the last couple of months that have gone on yeah well listen it was, a, it was a really enjoyable game once again you guys have just played some ridiculous football you know it's a joy to watch when you're all in full flow it's awesome so huge congratulations like historical stuff Kevin McManaman eight All-Irelands you know outrageous well done and uh, Johnny Cooper I don't know how many you're going to have when you retire, but seven is, is not by going uh, so far, to say the least. So, Johnny, Kevin, thanks a million, lads. Appreciate it. Thanks, Joe. OTB.
a.m. With Gillette, we don't just play the game, we change it. Gillette, made of what matters.